remembers the prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our king, to his government, to members of the legislative assembly, and to all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the province wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideas, but laying aside all private interest and prejudice. Keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all. Amen. Amen. Honorable members, it being the last sitting day of the week, we will now be led in the singing of God Save the King by Ashley Stevens. seated. Can you take this to this pit, please? Introduction of visitors. Honorable members, I'd like to introduce to the assembly a number of special visitors joining us today in the speaker's gallery from the Lubicon First Nation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you and through me the chief, Billy Joe Labacon, chief of Libicon, Labacon First Nation. Joining him in the gallery today are a number of counselors from the nation. Tracy Carter Labacon, Tim Labacon, Troy Labacon, Brian Labacon, and band director Albert Thunder. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the assembly. Honorable members, it's also introduce, uh, or it's my pleasure to introduce to you a, a good friend of many here in the building, and certainly a friend of the Speaker's office, Gabriel Symbolis, uh, who many of you know works in the building, and today is sadly her last day, and want to wish her all the best in her future endeavors. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the assembly. Mr. Wainwright has a school group. Speaker, speaker, I'd like to introduce to you and through you 24 members visiting from the Irma Grade 6 class, a uh, great town with great baseball. So uh, please rise and receive the warm welcome of the assembly. The Honorable Member for Sherwood Park has a school group. Mr. Speaker, uh, through you and to you, the members of the assembly, I'd like to introduce you to the students and staff of St. Teresa Catholic School in Sherwood Park who have been debating what the length of the recess should be at their school today and have come up with a great decision. Please rise and give us the warm welcome. We'll give you the warm welcome to the assembly. The Honourable the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to introduce to you and through you to all members of the assembly a great grade six class from Rocky Christian School. Mr. Speaker, as you know, they've been doing it up there since 1799, and these kids are one of the best groups of kids to come out of Rocky Mountain House. I'd ask him to rise and receive the traditional warm welcome of the assembly. Sarah. The Honourable Member for St. Albert has an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce to you and through you members of the Alberta Life Lease Protection Society, Anthony Wong, Art Merrick, Ava Dowling, Betty Lou Monroe, Christiane Konaschuk, Daniel Lamb, Deb Volroth, Dwayne MacArthur, Gail Mischuk, and George Yeoman. I have more, but I'll let my colleagues introduce them. Thank you, Adam Ross. The Honourable the Minister of Advanced Education. to introduce to you and through you to all members of this assembly, Margaret Wing, CEO of the Alberta Pharmacists Association, along with a select number of Doctor of Pharmacy students and board members from across Alberta. I ask Margaret and all the pharmacy students and board members present to please rise and receive the traditional warm welcome of the assembly. The Honourable Member for Lester Slave Lake. 
Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to rise again, as usual, with more of my guests today. Uh, the, these guests today are from the Treaty 8 First Nation. I'd like to reintroduce uh, the leaders from the Lubicon Cree Nation. Chief uh, Billy Joel Labocan, Tracy Carter Labocan, Tim Labocan, Troy Labocan, Vera, uh, and the Director Albert Thunder from the Nation, and also uh, my other Indigenous brothers and sisters from the Sucker Creek First Nation. Please rise again, if you don't mind, and uh, enjoy the warm reception from uh, this wonderful chamber. Energy and Minerals as an introduction. Mr. Speaker, I rise to welcome some folks from the Energy and Minerals Department who work so hard for the people of Alberta. I'd like to introduce them to you and through you and to the people here in the House. So if they could rise, please, and receive the warm welcome of the Assembly. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie is next. Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, privileged to rise and introduce to you and through you Chris Rempel, a Grand Prairie local leader and businessman, predominantly in the energy sector, and who I consider a longtime friend. So please uh, rise and receive the warm welcome of this assembly. Uh, Minister of Indigenous Relations, uh, uh, of Indigenous Relations first. Chief Roderick Willier, Director of Operations Jamie Lynn, Executive Secretary Angela Kaliu, and Economic Development Director Shirley Kaliu. I had a great meeting with the Chief and his team this morning. They're doing a fantastic job advocating for their nation and promoting Sucker Creek. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the Assembly. The Honourable Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I rise to introduce to you and through you two great people from Sundry, Alberta, dear friends. First, Dave Leslie, as lo along with him, the great Steve Overgaard, one of Sundry's favourite sons, Mr. Speaker, who's world renowned for his car hearts, Mr. Speaker, and his great beard, and is also one of the greatest friends I've ever had. I ask him to rise, both of them, and receive the traditional warm welcome of this assembly. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo. Two entrepreneurs, Julieta Ranger and Claudia Miranda, who started Kid Drop, which provides children's transportation or small business of the year uh, in Fort McMurray. Thank you so much. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie Wood, uh, sorry, Grand Prairie Wapiti. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my privilege to rise and introduce to you, uh, to you, and uh, to the Assembly, Jared and Jennifer Schroeder. Jared is my pastor at West Point Community Church, and I'm glad that they can come and visit. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the Assembly. The, uh, the Honourable Minister of Children and Family Services. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. At the end of the list. To you and through you and to all the rest of the members of the Assembly, my good friend Tim Schindel, with Leading Influence, which provides spiritual and emotional care to Canadian politicians, and Jeremiah with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, and a pastor of the Public Church in Old Strathcona. Please rise and accept the warm welcome of the Assembly. The Honourable Member for West Yellow Hill, uh, White Mud. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to introduce to you and through you uh, members of the Alberta Life Lease Protection Society, including Gordon Wyatt, who was my junior high drama teacher, Hulda Yellick, Janice uh, Olivier, Jim Carey, Karen Dowling, Kim Nelson, Lyle uh, Cameron, Marie Schultz, and May Wong. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the, of the chamber. The member for Edmonton Highlands, Norwood. To introduce more incredible advocates from the Life Lease Protection Society, I would like to uh, introduce Ron Dowling, Ruth Marriott, Sharon Mill, Shonda Yauman, Stephen Graham, and Vivian Scholey. If they could all rise and uh, receive the traditional warm welcome of this house. Thank you for being here. Seeing none. Ministerial statements. Member statements. The Honourable Member for Banff, Ken Anaskis, has a statement to make. Alberta's new renewable regulations have generated quite a bit of discussion. There are concerns around the hypocrisy of creating a series of regulations for one industry and not others. There are concerns about telling people what they can and cannot do on their private lands. And then there are concerns around the pristine viewscapes designation. Standing in the southern Alberta grasslands, looking towards the foothills and the mountains, I'm always struck by how picturesque it looks. It's almost like a painting or like a pretty tapestry draped on the landscape. But what's happening behind the curtain, Mr. Speaker? Let's take a closer look at the eastern slopes, the headwaters of southern Alberta, and the pristine viewscapes. The native rough fescue grasslands that sequester carbon are being, built, are being ripped up to build access roads. Coal exploration has created 460 kilometers of new roads, adding hundreds of kilometers to the existing linear footprint. 
The Old Man Reservoir is filled with tons of sediment, all of it former soil from the eastern slopes. Forestry in the headwaters has altered fish habitat by reducing shade along streams, meaning there are less bull, big trout here and less angling opportunities as well. Motorized recreation continues to go unchecked on large portions of public lands, reducing recreational opportunities for others and displacing wildlife. Coal mining is still a possibility, even though its impacts will reach far beyond the eastern slopes. Land use plans like the Livingston Porcupine Recreation Plan or linear footprint planning keep getting put on hold while more roads are built. Species from cutthroat trout to grizzly bears and migratory birds struggle to adapt to an ever-changing landscape impacted by development. The cumulative effects of these activities continue to threaten the quality and quantity of water available to communities downstream. We must do better. What's happening behind the curtain, Mr. Speaker? A whole lot. And do these new renewable regulations intentionally address any of it? Nope. But hey, at least the eastern slopes are pretty to look at. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Lawhe. Speaker, over the years, the Liberal government in Ottawa have been imposing their destructive agenda on Alberta taxpayers through direct funding agreements with cities and provincially regulated and funded organizations. Not only does Alberta not receive its per capita share of federal taxpayer dollars, the dollars we do receive are often wasted on unneeded programs and infrastructure that are not aligned with the priorities of Albertans. For much of our recent history, Alberta has paid far more in federal taxes than we get back in programs or transfers. Even during the last economic downturn, we were the largest net contributor to federal finances. And yet, we consistently receive less than our provincial neighbours in per capita funding. When we do receive funding and those federal dollars come with ideological strings attached, offering funding on its own terms, bypassing the provinces and forcing municipality, municipalities to dance to Ottawa's tune. In other cases, Ottawa ignores programs already in place and wastefully spends on identical programs like farmer care and dental care when what we really need is envelope funding to expand existing provincial programs in these areas. Mr. Speaker, here's a partial list of things that the Prime Minister could do instead of interfering with provincial matters. They could get rid of the consumer carbon tax, bring in the clean energy investment tax credit that they promised, address public safety concerns resulting from their lenient bail system. They could properly manage federal finances, deficits and debt to combat the inflation that's squeezing every Canadian today, and maybe balancing the budget too. Our government believes Albertans are entitled to their fair share of federal funding and to have that funding spent on priorities that matter to them. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that happens. Mr. Speaker, Alberta's government will not put up with any other manipulation or political interference from the Liberals in Ottawa. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glornora, has a statement to make. talking to Albertans right across this province and they keep telling me that their priorities are health care, climate and housing. But the UCP yesterday tabled their bill that they called the Provincial Priorities Act and what's their bill? To pick a fake fight with Ottawa that will have real consequences for Alberta voters and Alberta residents. They want to make sure that school boards, municipalities, other partners that enter into intergovernmental agreements can't do so with Ottawa or any other province or any other government without their permission. How arrogant, how disrespectful, how rude for the people who are on the street struggling to find housing right now to say to Ottawa and to any other partner, no, not unless this Premier agrees with you, to say to anybody in need of health care support, things like diabetes medication or birth control, no, not without the Premier's support, to say to anybody in need of clean air on a hot summer's day when wildfires are blazing and they are crying for climate action and wanting partners to step up and work with us, not against us, no, not without this Premier's approval. Bill 18 is not anything near the priorities of the people of Alberta. It might be about the political priorities of the current Premier, but I'll tell you, the next Premier is going to focus on health care, climate and housing. The next Premier is going to put forward real solutions. I was so proud today to roll out my housing platform and to be able to talk about where we're going to actually invest money in this province of Alberta, to make sure that we work with other partners to free up public lands, public lands that school boards and municipalities are sitting on that could be excellent opportunities for housing, making sure that no more than a 
third of that housing that's being put on public land is at market rate, making sure that at least a third of it is below market rate and making sure that at least a third of it is affordable, tied to income. These are the kinds of solutions people are looking for. These are the kinds of solutions that I'm going to put forward and my colleagues are going to put forward. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be fighting in this leadership race and to be standing up for Premier hopefully in the next election, inshallah. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Order, the Honourable Member for Laxane and Parkland. Order, order, order. Mr. Speaker, it should come to no surprise in anyone here that I'm a bit of a storyteller. It's my way to get people to think and hopefully do it in a nice way. When I was 13, we had a late spring, ponds and rivers were still frozen, snow on the ground, cows were still in the, in the cabin pens and calving was just wrapping up. Well, checking the cows, I came across a young moose calf trying to get in the water cap or in the water trough. The moose was sick. It was sick, it was acting funny, terrible looking coat, it was weak. We called Fish and Wildlife and they said they were not allowed to interfere with it. They advised that it was probably lousy with ticks and he was trying to get in the water trough to drown them. We could not interfere even though we had the medication to fix the problem, Mr. Speaker. That poor moose died a few days later and was heartbreaking. Didn't deserve that die, to die that way, killed by parasites. I was tasked to burn it to make sure the cows didn't come into contact, so it was diesel fuel and a tiger torch for my tools for the job. I know cowboys aren't supposed to cry, but as a young man I wept. Sadness, frustration, anger all combined thinking of that poor animal had suffered. I burned that and that squirming pile of ticks knowing it didn't have to die. That memory came back to me recently when I was explaining the negative impacts of the NDP Liberal policies that have whooped and taken our province and ruined our country's economy. Affordability, inflation problems are not by chance. It was just not one tick that brought that moose down, Mr. Speaker. The culmination of wackadoo woke, hard left socialist, eco warrior, self balancing budget, haphazard socialist spending policies have definitely taken their toll. Taxing people to change the weather on the guise of saving the environment through carbon pricing, it should be criminal. Even with the kick in the stomach and the April Fool's Day carbon tax joke by old uh, fancy socks, I still have hope. 70% of Canada's premiers are pushing back, and so are the voters. They're seeing that this is the lunacy what it is. Mr. Speaker, even the NDP leadership hopefuls are backing away from their steaming pile of carbon tax pricing policies that they put in place. Hypocrisy or cowardice, I'm not sure what describes it best when they didn't do anything. Pre Premier and ministers, don't back off. Spring's around the corner, time to get rid of some ticks. The Honourable Member for St. Albert. A beautiful glossy photo of an older person smiling, sitting in a lovely new apartment with an ad that says, life lease provide you with an ideal balance between certainty of owning and the flexibility of renting. If you make 0% loan to the life lease project, you pay zero net rent. Your investment is secured by a mortgage against the retirement community. And sales staff reassure seniors your money is safe and will be available when you choose to leave the building. Sounds pretty good, right? To date, Greg Christensen Group of Companies owes 183 seniors from nine buildings over $60 million. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The number of Christensen life lease amounts to be paid back will grow to over $200 million once more seniors move out for things like long-term care. Seniors and their families have been waiting to have their money, in many cases their life savings, return to them for up to three years. Alberta is currently the Wild West for life leases. There is no consumer protection for seniors when they want to end the lease and have their money returned, but the landlord refuses to do so. 388 people are members of the Alberta Life Lease Protection Society. Service Alberta Minister says he's fully consulted this group. The failure of Bill 12 to protect these seniors is proof the UCP consultation was incomplete at best. Bill 12 doesn't protect seniors from unscrupulous landlords. Bill 12 does nothing for the 380 members who are owed money. Bill 12 provides no assurance that life lease funds will be protected. Bill 12 does nothing to ensure money is returned in a timely fashion. Like the seniors here today, we urge the Premier to pull Bill 12, consult seniors, not just operators, and redraft legislation that fully protects seniors, including those victims of Christensen life lease fiasco. We have a housing and affordability crisis in Alberta. The UCP failure to create meaningful protection for life lease consumers will add to an evolving catastrophe for seniors and their families. Thank you. Now 150, and that makes it oral question period. And the leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition have question one. <laughs> 
Mr. Speaker, with Motel Medicine, we saw the UCP farm out important care and wash their hands of it. But now we're finding that Alberta's continuing care and supportive living centres are failing to meet the most minimal standards of care for some of Alberta's most vulnerable citizens. From 2018 to 2023, the violations on an annual basis have doubled to the Premier. Is her plan to eliminate legislated minimum standards of care happening because she thinks it will be easier to just scrap them than to actually meet them and enforce them? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the Government of Alberta is committed to ensuring Albertans get the care and the support they need in continuing care. So, Alberta Health monitors all facilities with outstanding non-compliances and escalates enforcement when the non-compliances could negatively impact the health, safety or well-being of residents or clients. So timelines for correcting outstanding non-compliances will vary depending on the severity of the infraction. Mr. Speaker, we are making sure that our seniors are safe. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the infractions have doubled, and the amount of time to fix them, they go on for years and years. This is what happens when a government runs on the basis of aspirational goals. In the real world, Alberta seniors are no longer able to count on adequate care, nutrition, and kitchens free of mouse droppings. This is not a situation where flexibility is the answer, Mr. Speaker. So to the Premier, will she scrap her plan to eliminate the minimum standard of care and instead implement a legislated minimum number of four hours of care, just like they did in Ontario. The Honourable the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, again, the members opposite are trying to create fear. In fact, Mr. Speaker, under the new regulations, we have, in fact, improved, gone from a 1.9 hours of care to over 3.62 hours of care that we're funding, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we are making sure that uh, safety is of paramount. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I've actually recently expanded the division in my department to respond to investigations like these complaints that were alleged. Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to make improvements. We're spending over a billion dollars. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Misspoke, Mr. Speaker, they did not increase regular standards of care, they eliminated them. Albertans expect accountability, especially when it comes to their care of their loved ones. For the first few days after Motel Medicine was revealed, those ministers over there denied it. That's and right. for this stuff, we had to dig through freedom of information requests and multiple websites. None of this should be a government secret, Mr. Speaker. So to the Premier, why won't she at least guarantee more transparency and enforcement and restore and expand the independence and scope of the seniors advocate. Good the Honourable Minister of Health. Speaker, again, the misinformation coming from the other side continues on and on and on. Mr. Speaker, in fact, that information is publicly available. You can see it on the website. Any Albertan can go and see it on the website. The fact that more our investigations are happening are, is the very reason that we have more people involved in doing those investigations. Mr. Speaker, I've added more people to the division because I want to make sure our seniors are safe. We've added over a billion dollars to continuing care, Mr. Speaker. We're going to keep doing what's right for Honourable seniors. Honourable Leader of the Opposition, first, second set of questions. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has taken her ideological control fixation to a new extreme. Albertans democratically elect entire councils who fight to get funding for their communities. From the UCP, though, they get funding cuts and downloaded costs, so they go to Ottawa seeking support for crucial local projects. That's local representatives standing up for their community. To the Premier, no one's elected this Premier mayor or councillor, so why does she think she has the mandate to pretend that they did? Honourable the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Well, I think it's courageous of the honourable member to talk about standing up for communities because that leader, when she was Premier, Denver did it once for Alberta in the entire four oh, years. Hair. Shame. And today, and today, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, has has the uh, chutzpah to stand here and and accept want Albertans to accept less than a billion dollars for housing when they should be getting more than two billions. Not good enough for us. Not good enough for municipalities. But I. Guess it's good enough for the NDP. Here, here. The order, the leader of the opposition. Highways, transit, 
and other infrastructure projects often need significant federal funding. Access to these projects help communities, and particularly our big cities, play a huge role in attracting private investment and jobs. Having municipal leaders advocate for Alberta is actually a feature of this system, not a bug. So, to the Premier, why doesn't she understand that this bill is giving major cities in every other province a huge competitive advantage over the Alberta mayors that she has now shackled with her red tape? Well, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Well, wrong again, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, you will do our best to maintain the, the agreements that the large cities have with the federal government. But in fact, the NDP leader is suggesting that 200, about 220 of Alberta's 230 municipalities get nothing. Newsflash, Alberta is bigger than, uh, than Edmonton and Calgary. I know they don't realize it over there. Rural Alberta matters. Mid-sized mid cities matter. Towns matter. We care about all Albertans, not just, our, not just our favorites like the folks across the way. Order, order, order the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the UCP is scared of things they just don't understand, which means, of course, they've been chasing post-secondary education with a fiscal version of torches and pitchforks for years. And this bill is just more of the same. Our world-class post-secondary institutions attract Nobel Prize-winning researchers and generate billions of dollars in economic activity every year. So to the Premier, does she not understand that blocking federal funding to our universities will affect the economy? Or does she think that that's just another case of what she doesn't know won't hurt her? Call the Minister of Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to supporting post-secondary institutes and attracting investment. We are introducing the Provincial Priorities Act to push back on overreach by the federal government because we know that that happens. The approvals process will be determined through engagement with post-secondary institutes and the regulatory development process. Our focus will be on ensuring federal agreements align with provincial priorities. Here, here. Here, here. Honourable Members, a point of order was noted at 154 by the Official Opposition House Leader and 156 by the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, West Henday is next. On Tuesday, a large grass fire ignited west of the Enoch Cree Nation, prompting an evacuation in the area. And I'm grateful that the fire has been extinguished and that those evacuated have been able to return to their homes. However, the stress and fear of having to evacuate on those impacted is huge, and we need to ensure that they are supported. To the Premier, was the government aware that there had been an evacuation as a result of this fire? When was she informed? And if she was, why has there been no announced support for the impacted community members? The Honourable the Minister of Forestry and Parks. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question. And of course, our hearts go out to anybody that's been evacuated. We know that we had a, uh, about 50,000 Albertans and uh, 38 communities last year, sorry, 38 communities, 50,000 Albertans uh, last year evacuated. Our hearts go out to them. We know that it disrupted their lives and their livelihoods, and we want to make sure that we keep that to a minimum. Uh, it was unfortunate that this happened to the Enoch Cree Nation. They were evacuated because of smoke from a fire. Uh, we have active firefighters on the landscape right now. Just an interesting fact, we've had 103 wildfires already started just this year. We only have nine left on the books, and that's because of the good work of the people in wildfire. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Sunday. So she was not informed, and I have heard from multiple Indigenous folks, such as from the East Prairie Métis Settlement, in regards to community concerns. There is no direction or guidance from this government. Communities are left to fend for themselves. The UCP tries to say they will invest money or they will provide emergency coordinators, and yet, when it comes to the actual time of wild wildfire igniting, this government is seemingly unprepared, with zero plans failing Indigenous peoples in Alberta. To the Premier, fire season has started. What is the plan for wildfires in nations like Enoch or in settlements like East Prairie? The Honourable Member or Minister for Stream Parks. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again for the question. The, uh, the, the Chief from Enoch uh, contacted Indigenous Relations Minister uh, when that, with that fire going on, and the, the Indigenous Relations Minister was in contact with East Prairie Métis Settlement through that fire too. I was out there at East Prairie Métis Settlement with the Premier here just a few months ago. Uh, we know that our, our First Nations people need to be protected. Their communities are quite often in areas where there's a, a danger of wildfire. We're working with them. We continue to work with them. We're concerned about them. 
We're working on community fire guards across this province to protect our communities. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue that good work. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West End A Métis Settlement resident last year stated that the UCP should not have cut the wildfire budget and rap attack as his community experienced the disaster of wildfires. Elders have also said that evacuation notices were dangerously late. Alongside ex-firefighters, this community fought the fire themselves while waiting for support. The UCP has a failed track record on Indigenous engagement for emergency response. Now they're ignoring Indigenous peoples when they tell this government when they need to keep their homes safe. To the Premier, why does the UCP continue to fail Indigenous peoples when it comes to protecting their homelands from wildfires? The Honourable Minister of Forestry and Parks. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as according to the the, the, minister, the opposite member there talking about the budget, we increased wildfire operations budget this year by $55 million, oh, oh, Mr. Speaker. That increased both uh, both on the ground firefighters to the tune of 140 people, but plus operational people too within the department. So we are uh, concerned about wildfire. We're concerned about uh, our communities. We're concerned about Go our First Nation communities. Training. And, uh, and we've reflected that in the budget, and we've acted on that budget, and we're making sure that we're doing everything we can to protect our communities, First Nations, and otherwise across Alberta. A point of order is noted at 2 o'clock by the Honourable the Government House Leader. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South has. Yesterday, the government introduced legislation to limit provincial institutions' autonomy from municipalities to post-secondaries. Our world-class research institutions attract the brightest minds using federal funds that are distributed by arm's-length granting councils, which the Premier calls ideologically driven. 35% of the U of C's research funding comes from the Government of Canada. How much is at risk to ensure the Premier's ideology is only one Unsupported at that institution. Good question. The Honourable the Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you to the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our financial statements indicate that $500 million are received by Alberta post-secondary institutions sent by the federal government every year. And I believe that Albertans have a right to know what these grants are, what they're funding, and Bill 18 will enable us to collect that information. But I do want to assure our post-secondary partners that they will be at the table as we conduct our engagement to make sure that the approvals process aligns with their priorities as well. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council make decisions based on the applications and the mandates of excellence, attraction, equity, and innovation. Alberta's arm's length institutions make decisions based on a mandate, and one may wonder how much political interference is already happening under the UCP. Will the Premier admit she is using the federal government as a smokescreen to justify control of organizations and academic thought in Alberta. Right. Minister of Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, again, $500 million is provided by the federal government to Alberta's post-secondaries, and it's important to know where this grant funding is going because it will allow the province to better partner with the post-secondaries as well. And I think industry, Albertans, and students have a right to know where this grant funding is going, and that's why Bill 18 is important for us to collect that information. Order, order. A point of order is noted at 2.03 by the Honourable the Government House Leader. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South. Federal funding includes Canada research chairs used to attract the brightest minds at Canadian universities. Alberta benefits by $24.7 million supporting research in sciences, social areas such as social entrepreneurship, criminology. These chairs decide where they research. Other jurisdictions are already reaching out, offering employment in less hostile environments. Will the Premier admit that she made a mistake and commit to Alberta's post-secondaries that they will be removed from the scope of Bill 18? Good. The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education. 
Speaker, the fact is the Government of Alberta is a strong partner with post-secondaries in Alberta. We provide billions of dollars Absolutely. to these institutions and we are going to work with them after the passage of Bill 18 yep. to sit down and talk about the approvals process and better understand where this funding is going because, again, this provides an opportunity to the provincial government to better partner with our post-secondaries when we have a more clear understanding of what that grant funding is for. Here, here. Here, here. For Edmonton White, might has a question to ask. Hundreds of Alberta seniors and their families in my riding have been scammed out of their life savings by Christensen developments and unregulated life leases. Many of those Albertans who the minister has failed to consult with on Bill 12 are in the gallery today. The government and AHS currently has several multi-million dollar contracts with the Christensen group of companies. Will the Premier commit today that those contracts will be terminated because not one single public dollar should go to a private company that is defrauding Alberta seniors? Yeah. The Minister of Service, Alberta and Red Team Production. <laughs> This is a deplorable situation when 180 uh, Albertans, vulnerable seniors, can't get their deposits back. I will say this, the answer to that, Mr. Speaker, is not to evict more seniors, as the member is asking. The answer to this is what I'm doing. Mr. Speaker, my department has met with Greg Christensen 12 times. I personally attended nine of those meetings. The purpose, Mr. Speaker, is to apply pressure. And Mr. Speaker, I've committed to not stopping until he's made every one of those Albertans whole. Order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud. Given there are currently 55 seniors in my riding who are owed over $16 million from Christians and Life Leases, and the first senior in the payout queue has been waiting almost three years for the return of their own money, and given when all of the current Life Leases with Christians are terminated, seniors across this province will be owed over $200 million, and given the Minister has claimed he wants to make these seniors whole, but Bill 12 and nothing that he has done makes any difference for these seniors, will the Premier commit today that the government or AHS will not enter into any new New contracts with Christensen until every dollar has been repaid. Minister of Service Alberta and Red Tape Production. Mr. Speaker, I, as I said, this is a deplorable situation, and the answer to this is not to evict more seniors. So, Mr. Speaker, I have said it before, and I'll say it again. I will keep meeting with Christians and Developments until every single Albertan is made whole. Now, Mr. Speaker, the purpose of this legislation is to make sure that this never happens again. And, Mr. Speaker, there are penalties in this legislation that includes fines up to $300,000. Mr. Speaker? Just because the member for St. Albert can't act with class or dignity doesn't mean that we won't on this side. Order, order, order. A point of order is noted at 207. Order, 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 order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud. Given that last month, Greg Christensen, a big UCP donor, boasted to the Alberta Life Lease Protection Society that he got a call from AHS about a potential untendered contract to use his vacant life lease units to move seniors out of hospitals, and given the minister told the group he would not support this, but shortly after, one of his staff contacted the society and asked them nervously if they were going to go public with the conversation. And given it's pretty simple, Greg Christensen and his companies owe Alberta seniors millions of dollars, not one new single public dollars should go to them. Will the Minister of Health commit right now that it will not? The Honourable the Minister of Service Alberta and Red Tape Production. M Mr. Mr. Speaker, here, here's what I can tell you. This situation... Order. 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 The Honourable the Minister of Service Alberta. Mr. Speaker... Order. Mr. Speaker, I apologize for identifying the member of St. Albert. In fact, the correct thing to point out is it's the entire caucus that lacks dignity and respect because we have 180 Albertans, Mr. Speaker, that have had their deposits kept from them. That is deplorable, and I have committed, and I will continue to commit, Mr. Speaker, that I won't stop putting pressure on Greg Christensen until every single one of those individuals has been made whole. A point of order is noted by the Honourable the Minister of uh, Seniors, Community and Social Services at 208. Order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Lesser... Uh, 
point of order is noted by the Honorable the Government House. Order. 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 Member for Lesser Slave Lake has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alberta is a global leader in agriculture research and technology, which results in tangible benefits for farmers, such as higher profits and more abundant food supply at an affordable cost for consumers. That's why I was so pleased this week that earlier, Alberta's government announced a $1.2 million grant to the University of Calgary's Simpson Centre and their Alberta Digitalization Agriculture Program. Could the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation please tell us how these funds will help Alberta farmers and ranchers better understand the challenges and opportunities for technology and digitalization Mr. in agriculture? Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this great question. Providing $1.2 million over three years for the Alberta Digitalization Agriculture Program at the University of Calgary Simpson Center will help us better understand how digital technology could increase agricultural productivity and competitiveness, improve food security, and have a positive impact on the environment. This innovative program will allow the school to research and provide recommendations on how producers can use and adopt new technologies to improve their operations. Here, here, good answer. Here, here. Order the Honourable Member for Lesser Slave Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister for that answer. Given that we are looking to the agriculture industry to continue as a leading contributor to Alberta's economy, and given this centre is a cutting-edge research and policy hub, and further given that this government will continue to fight for farmers, families and First Nations to eliminate their do-nothing carbon tax and continue to help Métis settlements like the East Prairie Settlement with $9 million to rebuild every single home lost in the wildfire, to the same minister, what are some tangible examples of the type of work the Simpson Centre will be doing? Good question. The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture Culture and irrigation. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Now, this center is going to create a platform for exports, our experts to exchange ideas to develop recommendations for the digitalization of agriculture. Mr. Speaker, Alberta is already a global leader in ag research and technology, and we're looking to continue that trend and carry on this leadership. Adopting new technologies, whether it be artificial intelligence, robotics and drones, data analytics, for example, will benefit Alberta producers, but also consumers by ensuring a safe, stable, and secure food supply. You're here. Member for Lesser Slave Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister for that wonderful answer. Given that modern agriculture is still a hands-on, boots-on-the-ground industry, and given that agriculture is a highly technical and skilled occupation, and given that the folks who make up Alberta's ag industry, whether it be farmers, ranchers, or researchers, all contribute to feeding families here in Alberta and across the globe, to the same Minister, how will this research impact farms and ranches, and when can producers expect to start seeing the results of the work in the fields? The Honourable the Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Simpson Centre's leading researchers have a significant role in finding solutions to the challenges, challenges farmers and ranchers face. This includes things like automation to reimagine labour-intensive processes, using technology to monitor crops, and installing smart sensors to monitor equipment and track maintenance. Mr. Speaker, innovation in ag tech is essential to help move this industry forward, and I know that with the constant growing demand for food, our crop and livestock associations really appreciate this type of work that this government is investing in right now. Here, here. For Sherwood Park is next. When this government isn't failing municipalities by getting them the unpaid taxes they are owed or downloading costs onto them, they are fixated on wrapping them in red tape to address the Premier's ideological agenda. Not a single municipality was consulted on Bill 18, the Premier's attempt to block Albertans from their own tax dollars, leaving many municipalities concerned that they will see projects cancelled or funding cut. Why didn't the Minister consult with even one municipality before introducing this bad bill? 
The order, the Honourable the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The folks across the way are probably satisfied with municipalities getting a billion or a two billion dollars less than would be equal okay. with other provinces. Okay. But on this side of the house, we are not satisfied. Here, here. We got elected to fight for Alberta, fight for Alberta citizens, and a fight for Alberta housing. We're not going to settle for here, here. half of any of those things. The NDP will settle with municipalities going without less housing, less Albertan support. On this side of the of the house, we will fight for municipalities and we'll fight for housing. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park. Given that the Mayor of Otasquin, who is the President of Alberta Municipality, said of Bill 18, we weren't consulted on it, and they didn't even know it was in the works. And given he has concerns that this bill is just another way for the province to continue blocking municipal funding, seeing as this government has cut this funding by 56% since 2019, forcing Albertans to pay higher property taxes while receiving less services, does the Minister have a message for those who will pay more and get less as a result of the Premier's plan to build a firewall between Albertans and their own money? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Mayor of Wetaskiwin is a very good person, and I'm helping him. Out of the 265 odd municipalities that Alberta municipalities represent, about 255 are getting zero. From the, uh, from the federal government. That is not equitable. We've heard folks on the other side talk about housing, talk about equity. This is neither of those things. Their leader is mouthing off, though their party did nothing when they were in power to support equity for Albertans, for their municipalities and people. We are not, we are not going to be satisfied until Albertans get what they need, equal with other provinces. The Honourable Member... Given that it's clear that the UCP has no respect for municipalities, and given that this minister has left rural municipalities with $260 million of unpaid property taxes under his watch that is growing year after year, and given that this minister, who has failed for years to address this, now wants to be the decider on what Albertans do with their tax dollars, how does the minister expect any municipality to trust him when he refuses to consult and puts the Premier's whims over the needs of Albertans? Minister. Here's uh, Mr. Speaker, a news flash for the folks over there out of the 65 rural municipalities that is about 60 that are getting zero in funding. Not good enough. You know what? The NDP might be happy with less than 10% getting some funding for housing. We'd like that number to be a lot closer to 100. Uh, there's the difference right there why rural su uh, Alberta supports this party, because we want everybody in Alberta to get funding. Calgary, Edmonton, and every other municipality, the folks over there are only satisfied on their close friends. All Albertans get support from this government. It's the way it will always be. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Southwest. Mr. Speaker, for the 161 families that are owed millions of dollars from Christensen communities, having their life savings taken away is devastating. They need their money back now. The Minister of Service Alberta says he can't do anything since his department is investigating, but what he doesn't mention is that his department is only investigating Christensen's sales tactics and not the lopsided contract seniors had signed. To the Minister, why isn't he using the full force of the Consumer Protection Act to investigate un fair practices. Yep. The Honourable the Minister of Service of Board Red Paper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. M Mr. Speaker, I don't interfere in investigations. I, uh, I looked as recently as last week, and that investigation is still open. Until that investigation is closed, I'm unable to comment on the matter. But I, I will say this, Mr. Speaker, we side with 180 Albertans that have not had their deposits returned. We think it's deplorable, and we will not stop putting pressure on that developer until every single Albertan has been paid back. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Southwest. Given that the point of the Consumer Protection Act is to protect Albertans from unfair practices and bad actors, and given that individual families owed money by life lease companies have three, four, five hundred thousand dollars tied up by these leases, and we're expecting decisive action from the minister, but are, but are instead blindsided and devastated by Bill 12, calling it quote a slap in the face and utterly disgusting. Why is the minister abandoning families and instead telling them to go to court when they have no more cash? Yeah. The the Honourable the Minister, Service Alberta Red Tape. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear that this bill brings in the most comprehensive protections that we have ever seen in the life lease industry in Alberta. It ensures that there's prescribed uh, time frames to be paid back. We've improved disclosure, and Mr. Speaker, we've even put in penalties that will include not up to not only up to three hundred thousand dollars in fines, but two years in prison. Mr. Speaker, we committed that this will not happen again, and it won't. Order the Honourable Member for Edmonton Southwest. Given that the Minister has a responsibility to protect Albertans full stop, and given that he already has powers to protect consumers from unethical companies and tactics, but is instead allowing bad actors to get away with it, with a further $146 million being held by Christensen from current life lease holders, why is a Minister refusing to take immediate action to protect consumers, not from future life leases, but from existing unscrupulous practices? Yes, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the answer to that question is, is because the, those protections don't exist today. And that's the urgency to passing this legislation, Mr. Do? Speaker, so that this situation never happens again. In the future, there will be prescribed time frames. There will be in, improved disclosure, transparency. There will be penalties, interest rates uh, if, if it's not paid back within 180 days. And lastly, there will be fines up to $300,000 or two years in prison. Mr. Speaker, if the member would read the legislation, he would know that this will go a long way to making sure that this never happens again. The Honourable Member for La Companoca has a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ability to access the internet has become an essential component of everyday life. However, ensuring rural Albertans have fast and effective internet continues to pose a problem. Given the increasing need for high-speed internet connection across Alberta and given options such as fiber optic and Starlink are unavailable or out of reach to many constituency members, to the Minister of Technology and Innovation, can you outline what broadband infrastructure currently exists in the constituency of Lacombe Panoka? The Honourable the Minister of Technology and Innovation. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, the larger population centres within the constituency of Lacombe Panoka, including Panoka, Lacombe, Black Falls, and Alex, have access to a mix of gigabit capable fibre, hybrid fibre, as well as some upgraded and fixed wireless high speed internet. While some rural areas of the constituency can access fixed wireless high-speed internet, other areas are experiencing more challenges, particularly homes in the west, southeast, and far northeast. Currently, homes in the Lacombe Panoka are able to access high-speed internet through Starlink's residential service, which is available nationwide. Mr. Speaker, this is why the Alberta Broadband the Strategy Honourable is Honourable Member so for Lacombe Panoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the Minister. Given much of the riding is rural, with many constituents living a significant distance from their nearest community hub, and given many families, such as myself, have had to seek out expensive alternative internet infrastructure to have a successful and consistent high-speed connection, to the Minister of Technology and Innovation, what types of future infrastructure investment can we expect to see in the constituency of Lacombe Panoka? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to say, as a part of Alberta's broadband strategy, we've allocated $390 million over five years to expand high-speed internet infrastructure across the province. And just yesterday, I was at a broadband event in Red Deer County to share the good news that we are investing $8 million to connect 10 <laughs> communities in that region to high-speed internet services. Black Falls, which falls within the constituency of Lacombe Panoka, is one of these communities. Gull Lake South is another one that is uh, going to be connected through the broadband strategy. Our government is committed to getting all Albertans access to high-speed internet by 2027, and Mr. Speaker, we are 55% of the way there already. Order, order, order. A point of order is noted at 2.22. The official opposition House leader, the Honourable Member for Lacombe Panoka, second supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, through you to the Minister. Given some seniors frequently struggle to navigate and successfully conduct business online, and given seniors and seniors' lodges are a critical part of our community, given quality, high-speed internet can come at a hefty cost to some of our seniors who rely only on pensions, and given many seniors can have a hard time moving to digital infrastructure, to the same Minister, what is being done to ensure we are helping our seniors bridge the gap to the digital world, yet enabling them to still access their required support systems? The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say we recently announced the Alberta Digital Literacy Program, which can help Albertans, including seniors, gain the confidence and skills they need to engage with our increasingly digital world. 
Whether it's accessing products, services, or information online, or just reaching out to loved ones, digital literacy can help Alberta's seniors build the needed skills to engage online safely. This government is committed to helping our seniors in this digital age, which is why we've made these digital courses free of charge, available for every Albertan uh, at digitalliteracy.alberta.ca. As of March 27th of 2024, uh, hundreds of individuals have used these programs for free, and of those, about one-third are seniors. Calgary Foothills. Mr. Speaker, in 2022, the government released the Alberta's Technology Innovation Strategy with five broad goals accompanying objectives including increasing the depth of our talent pool, increasing access to capital, facilitating commercialization, optimizing our ecosystem, and enhancing our reputation. The strategy does not include any performance indicators for these goals, making it difficult to measure any form of success. Can the Minister tell us exactly how many jobs have been created and revenue generated by companies through the implementation of that strategy? Will Albertans see a progress report. The Honourable Minister of Technology and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you some numbers that I think are really meaningful. When the NDP were in government in 2017, only $30 million of tech investment. While we are in government in the last couple of years, $729 million of tech investment in 2022. And in uh, 2023, Mr. Speaker, again, over $700 million. And we did that, Mr. Speaker, at the same time that the Canadian venture market was deeply on the decline. In fact, it went down by 30% last year. Alberta is bucking the trend. Alberta is leading the country. We are the fastest growing, most exciting technology sector in the country, and it's going to stay that way. The order, the Honourable Member for Calgary Foothills. Given that the approved budget in 23-24 was double that requested from program staff, given that the strategy includes initiatives to enhance short-term skills development, apprenticeship programs, expanding work integrated learning, developing micro-credentialing, given that the strategy also includes expanded post-secondary and launching an accelerated technology pathways for immigration, can the Minister share with us how many more technology jobs have been filled since the technology strategy had been implemented? Minister of Technology and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, there's never been a better time to be in tech in Alberta than today, and we're just getting started. We have more tech companies than ever before. They are growing faster than ever before. They are raising more money than ever before. And for the first time in my lifetime, we can say we have between 10 and 12 tech companies in Alberta worth a billion dollars. There has never been tech unicorns under the NDP. There are tech unicorns under the UCP, Mr. Speaker. What we are doing is working, and we are working closely with our tech sector to continue continue that momentum and to continue attracting investment, continue creating jobs, and Mr. Speaker, I'm having a lot of fun doing it. The Honourable Member for Calgary Foothill. Given that Alberta saw no growth in venture capital in 2023, given that this budget did not recapitalize Alberta Enterprise Corp, and given that the government directs tier funding to debt repayment instead of tech and innovation, given that despite repeated broken promises, the UCP has failed to replace the Alberta Investor Tax Credit or the Digital Media Tax Credit that they eliminated, does the Minister intend to re-promise the tax credits they've been unable to deliver so far? If not, how does he plan to ensure access to capital at all stages? stages of growth. The Minister. Mr. Speaker, the only time there was no growth in venture capital was when the NDP were in government. Mr. Speaker, we have been able to grow our venture capital exponentially in the last four years, and we're going to keep that going. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, the entire Canadian market was down by 30% last year. We held steady at over $700 million compared to $30 million when the NDP were in government. Mr. Speaker, everywhere I go, I talk about what's happening in Alberta Tech. No matter where I go across the country or around the world, everyone agrees. There's something special happening happening in Alberta in our tech sector and they want to be a part of it. The Honourable Member for Athabasca Bar at Westlock. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Providing adequate school facilities is crucial to ensuring that every child in Alberta has access to quality education. As we strive to create a better future for our youth, it's essential to understand the government's commitment to funding and developing school facilities across the province. Can the Minister of Education elaborate on the government's strategies for providing school facilities throughout Alberta, particularly in rural areas, and how budgetary allocations are being prioritized to meet the needs of our communities? The Honourable the Minister of Education. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a top priority for our government to ensure that uh, we are building and modernizing schools, uh, of course, in our fastest growing communities, uh, but also in all communities across the province. Just this past Friday, I had the opportunity of um, announcing, the, along with the Premier, the development of the uh, replacement junior high school in Brooks. We have a number of replacement and new school projects underway in every corner of the province. Mr. Speaker, we're working aggressively because Alberta Alberta is back and booming. People are moving here in droves, and we're going to make sure they have the schools they need. Honorable member for Athabasca Bar, Ed Westlock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the importance of timely school project execution in meeting the educational needs of our communities, and given the diverse stages from planning to completion of these projects, and further, given the ongoing concerns raised by the opposition NDP regarding school constru construction projects, often without a full understanding of the project stages, can the Minister of Infrastructure, for the benefit of the House and especially for the opposition, outline the different stages in school development projects and the corresponding timelines for completion? Great question. The Honourable the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the province has a whopping 98 schools in the queue at one of four stages. Pre-planning, which addresses capacity and site selection. Planning creates a functional plan. Design and tender includes cost estimates, drawing, uh, drawings, permitting and bidding. And okay. The Honourable the Minister of Infrastructure is the one with the call. I know how contentious this is. And finally, <laughs> construction. Generally, depending on size and complexity, it takes three to four years to build a school and get kiddos in the seats. Mr. Speaker, our department continues to work and take every opportunity to speed up timelines and reduce costs, of course, while maintaining quality. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that some school projects have been identified in my constituency for replacement and modernization, and given the significant importance of these schools to the communities in my riding, namely the Malay Replacement School Project, Barhead Composite High School Modernization, the Holy Family Catholic School in Wasetna, can the same minister provide updates for my constituents on the progress of these three projects and the expected timelines for completion? The Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to let the member know that all three projects he mentioned are currently in design. We expect the Holy Family School to tender later this year. All will have shovels in the ground in 2025, ready for a September 26 opening. Mr. Speaker, in 2015 and in 2016, before the Nenshi Trojan horse and Liberal invasion, the NDP announced zero schools. Since 2019, we invested $1.4 billion into 120 projects with more on the way. We have a roadmap for success and we're sticking to it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Edgemont has a question. Mr. Speaker, last fall I had the opportunity to meet with Zayana Kuda, a constituent advocate for menstrual equity. I was thrilled to host a successful period poverty drive in Calgary Edgemont's constituency and with the generosity of the community it has resulted in a permanent period poverty drive um, and an ongoing endeavour. Supplies can be dropped off at my office. Given that period poverty, the lack of access to menstrual products continues to enforce gender barriers in our province. What is the province provincial government currently doing to uh, end menstrual inequality in Alberta? The Honourable the Minister of Arts, Culture and the status of women. Mr. Speaker, our government values the health care of all Albertans, including women. Period poverty and menstrual products is something that the member asked me about in estimates of which I addressed, and it's something that as a government we will continue to look into and consider. Order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Calgary Edgemont. Given that this government did not continue with the United Way period promise campaign in 2021 to provide free menstrual products to schools, and given that schools need barrier-free access to pads and tampons, with statistics indicating that 62% of students have left or missed school because period products weren't available to them, given that the Alberta is in the midst of the worst affordability crisis in memory, and access to period products should not be considered a luxury item. Minister, 
Why not prevent access to Menster products to all provincial buildings and schools? Yes. Honourable the Minister of Arts, Culture, the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said before, and I'll say again, our government values the health and well-being of all Albertans, including women. And when it comes to menstrual, menstrual products available in schools, again, these are conversations that I'm open to. The member opposite knows that I spoke about this in estimates, and it's something that we will look at. Given that we must advance momentum towards menstrual equality and establish proactive gender transformative policies at the provincial level to set up all women and girls for success, and given the stigma surrounding menstruation can be a significant barrier preventing women and young girls from exercising their sexual and reproductive rights, given that equitable access to menstrual products and education about reproductive health is an essential part of health care. When will the UCP government step up and, at the very least, permanently provide free period products in all provincial buildings? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'll repeat as what I've previously said. This government believes in Albertans and believes in supporting the health and well-being of all Albertans, and this is something that we will consider and look at as we do all products and services. The Honourable Member for Calgary Curry has a question. Mr. Speaker, this government has utterly failed to listen to or properly support health care workers. Time and time again, we've seen them claim to know better than those on the front lines when it comes to Albertans and their health. The Premier says smoking isn't actually bad for you and that stage four cancer is the patient's fault. The Premier denies health rights and protections for trans youth, and now the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction moralizes his way out of providing life-saving services for people suffering from addiction. Can the Premier or any of the ministers opposite tell us why they know better than highly trained health professionals about what is the best care for their Patients. Point of order is noted at 2.35 by the Honourable the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. The oh. Minister of... Point of order. New one. It's a different one. It's two. The Honourable the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Mr. Speaker, this government takes incredibly seriously Albertans who are in vulnerable positions, and our response is to care for them and meet them wherever they are. So whether it be an individual suffering from addiction, we want to be there to help them through recovery. If it's an individual suffering from a mental health crisis, we need to be there to get them the support. We need to make sure no matter where Albertans are, we're there to support them in their moments of crisis, and we respond to those in need. For Curry. Curry. Given that the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions glibly refers to harm reduction as harm production, and given that there are hundreds of healthcare professionals working in harm reduction who are now under the Minister's mandate, and given that the rate of burnout, turnover, and mental health challenges among healthcare providers is at an all-time high, can the Minister tell Albertans how he plans to support Recovery Alberta when he has shown such disdain and disrespect for the life-saving workers on the front lines? The Honourable the Minister Mental health and of order is noted at 236 by the Honourable the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we're talking about burnout from our frontline workers, we will not go down the path that BC has gone down, where they're putting at risk nurses in hospitals who are told that they have to accept any knife that is four inches or less in their hospital work. Please. They have to accept second-hand crystal meth and fentanyl smoke. We will not do that. Mr. Speaker, if by harm reduction you mean to say naloxone, yes. If by harm reduction you mean to say beds in our drug, in our, uh, drug consumption sites and in our recovery centers, absolutely. If if instead you mean safe supply, high-powered opioids dumped into our communities, it's an absolute no and twice on Sunday. No, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Curry. Given that the Premier, given that the Premier made it clear they would be moving ahead with Recovery Alberta, having pursued no consultation with health care providers, given that the same Premier has spoken with extreme ignorance just yesterday, outright insulting nurses working in managed alcohol programs, which are well-recognized and proven therapy that save lives. I'll ask once more, why does the minister think any nurse or social worker would want to stay employed with Recovery Alberta when the UCP regularly insults them by claiming they are producing harm for the people whose lives they are actually saving? Good question. Uh, 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 a point of order is noted at 2.38 by the Honourable the Government House Leader, the Minister of Mental Health. 
Mr. Speaker, we had the largest recovery conference in Canada last week in Calgary with over 2,000 individuals where we have resumes flowing into Recovery Alberta because nobody wants to work in the, in the devastating environment created by decriminalization and safe supply in British Columbia. In this side of the border, we will not go there. We believe we have an obligation, Mr. Speaker, to be hopeful. And that is why recovery is the centre of someone's crisis, whether it be addiction or mental health. And the path forward is one of optimism, Mr. Speaker. Order, 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 order. The Honourable Member for Calgary Curry might not like the answer. The Minister is entitled to give it. And the use of unparliamentary language, whether it's on the record or off the record, is still unparliamentary. The Honourable, the Minister. Mr. Speaker, members opposite do not like it because this is a path of hope and life and they prefer death and destruction, Mr. Speaker. The, the, oh, oh, order, 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 order. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As many Albertans know, especially in areas such as my riding of Livingston McLeod, Alberta is currently in stage four of its water shortage management response plan, an effort to cope with the drought conditions. The effects of drought are numerous and include economic losses in agriculture and ranching. Since it is crucial to ensure drought affected regions gain access to necessary water and considering that large water license stakeholders are currently being met with, to the Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, what is being done to ensure that small water license holders will have their voices heard to ensure their livelihoods are kept? The Honourable the Minister of Environment and Protected Areas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. My department has met with dozens of communities and smaller license holders this year as we help them to find new and better ways to conserve water and prepare for the risk of drought that we're seeing this year. And we are, in fact, ramping up this work, Mr. Speaker. In the next couple of weeks, we'll reach out to more than 2,000 smaller water users in southern Alberta alone. These are unprecedented efforts, Mr. Speaker, and they will help protect communities and businesses alike this year. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that drought relief is one of the critical responsibilities of our government, and given that, it is important that we are able to provide aid in a timely manner. And further given that some drought relief mitigations can cross over different ministries, which could potentially create some confusion and delay. To the same Minister, what is being done to ensure that government drought relief mitigations are not getting bogged down by cross-ministerial red tape? The Honourable the Minister of environment and protected areas. That is an excellent question, Mr. Speaker. Nothing irritates me more than unnecessary red tape, especially when it comes to solving the issues uh, that are facing Albertans right now when it comes to drought. That's why our departments are working together to support municipalities and water users. We're working to increase flexibility and help landowners, irrigators, and communities by making changes, for example, to pause the 10% holdback when it's not needed, fast-tracking regulatory reviews for requests to move water intakes or other drought-related changes. We'll continue to cut red tape so Albertans can respond to the changing drought conditions that we're seeing. Awesome. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that it is necessary that drought-affected municipalities coordinate a co cohesive drought response plan to best mitigate the damages of drought, and further given that communities like Pincher Creek went into early mandatory water restrictions, and yet larger downstream municipalities such as Lethbridge only adopted voluntary water restrictions later on. To the same minister, can you explain why communities so close together have been adopting different water restriction timelines, and what is being done to help these communities adopt more coordinating drought prevention restrictions going forward? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I really do want to thank the member for being such a great advocate for her communities, as I know that these are concerns that they raised when we met with them last week. Water is a shared responsibility, and so local water restrictions are municipal jurisdiction. But as the member and I met with municipalities in the Crow's Nest Pass last week, we heard this very concern. Every drop that you save can help Albertans and your neighbours downstream, Mr. Speaker. That's why we will be launching a public awareness campaign as well next month to inform all Albertans on how they can take action to conserve water and reuse more water during this time. Good job. Fortunately, that concludes the time allotted for oral question period. In 30 seconds or less, we'll continue with the remainder of the daily routine.
honorable member for Calgary Elbow. Madam Speaker, before the British conquest of India, our English words of Indian origin were about wealth and power, words like mogul, nabob, bungalow. Or the source of that wealth and power, which was a world-leading textile industry, calico, dungaree, seersucker. During the Raj, these loan words changed. Loot, thug. The massive wealth extraction machine that the British Raj built in India, spoiling one of the world's most fertile agricultural regions and shattering an industrial base, had never been seen before. A famine every 20 years during the Raj, and not a single one since. A legacy of starvation that lives on in my genes, in my own sensitivity to heart disease and diabetes. Naturally, South Asians fought back, mostly peacefully, sometimes not, up to and including war. Their resistance provoked an ever harsher response. All that, Madam Speaker, is prologue to the shameful massacre of hundreds of peaceful protesters in Jalainwala Bagh on April 14, 1919 the anniversary of which is, this week, the, which is this weekend. General Rex Dyer marched into a square, closed the exits, and ordered sharpshooters to start killing. Men, women, children, babies. The youngest victim was six months old. Dyer was cashiered, sent home at half pay, and as a result of this injustice, the House of Lords rectified it with a lifetime pension. Racist writer Rudyard Kipling wrote about Dyer, he did his duty. True words. Killing babies for the Raj was Dyer's duty, and he did it, and by accounts enjoyed it, and was pensioned for it. To this day, the British government has never formally apologized for this massacre, impacting the dignity and respect South Asian Canadians feel in our homes. And we know here in Canada that apology and reconciliation is not just about the victim, but as well allows the perpetrator to heal and change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Standing in special committees, presenting petitions, notices of motions, introduction of bills, tabling returns and reports. Are there the honourable member for Cypress Medicine Hat has a tabling? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today uh, to table five requisite copies of a transcript from a speech made by the member from Edmonton Highlands Norwood at a rally about supporting homeless encampments instead of finding appropriate housing and shelter for Albertans. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie, Wapiti. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to table five requisite copies of a tweet from the member of Edmonton Highlands Norwood bearing witness to the removal of encampments. The Honourable Member for Leduc Beaumont. Speaker, I rise today to table the requisite five copies of a tweet from the member from Edmonton High Highlands Norwood protesting the removal of garbage from an encampment. The Honourable Member for Calgary Lougheed. No, no tablings for me. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie. Uh, I rise today to table the five requisite copies of a retweet from the member of Edmonton Highwoods Norland that protested the removal of gang-operated drug markets. Tablings, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. I feel so honoured. I, I rise to, uh, to uh, table the requisite number of copies of emails from constituents urging the UCP to support Bill 205 and institute rent caps, and these are all constituents from various Calgary ridings, and I urge the Minister especially to read these emails. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary Curry, followed by the Honourable Member for Fish Creek. Five copies of a recent article from the International Journal of Drug Policy entitled Everybody is Impacted, Everybody's Hurting Grief, Loss, and the Emotional Impacts of Overdose on Harm Reduction Workers. Uh, the Honourable Member for Calgary Fish Creek. 2003, a news release from the opposition responding to an email from the Edmonton Chief of Police to remove encampments. The release calls on the government to stop plans to move unhoused Edmontonians to proper housing. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park. Scammed by UCB donor Greg Christensen's companies has left my constituent Elizabeth and her family awaiting repayment of $500,000 loan from Bedford Village. I'm tabling the letter from Elizabeth's family to highlight the shortcomings of Bill 12, the Life Lease Protection yeah. Amendment Act. Member for Chester Strathmore. Requisite copies of a tweet from the member for Edmonton Highwoods Norland protesting police action to prevent the spread of gang-operated drug markets. The Minister of Justice and the Keeper. 
of the Great Seal of Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too rise today to table the requisite copies of tweets from the member for Edmonton's High Edmonton Highwoods Norwood rallying against the removal of gang-operated drug markets and keeping vulnerable people in dangerous situations. Member for Laxane and Parkland. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise uh, to submit the records of copies from the Edmonton Journal from an article from the member of Highlands Norwood stating members signed letters to stop removal encampments, also known as TARP cities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there others? Seeing none. Tablings to the clerk. I wish to advise the Assembly that the following document was deposited with the Office of the Clerk. On behalf of Honourable Mr. Dreeshen, Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, supplemental response to questions raised by Mr. Dack, Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung, on March 19, 2024, Ministry of Transportation and Economic Corridors, 2024-25 Main Estimates Debate. Deferred divisions. Honourable members, that brings us to points of order. And at 1.54, the Honourable of the Official Opposition House Leader rose on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Happy Ledge Friday to you and all in the chamber. Um, this afternoon, our session began with the Chief Government Whip uh, giving a member statement which seemed to equate members of the official opposition with ticks who should be drowned. Uh, perhaps he was only referring to our policies, uh, but it was a raw, awful start to the session, Mr. Speaker, uh, having that dehumanizing language. Uh, pointed at your political opponents. Uh, it's certainly, there's a great deal of human history where that has been done, uh, and I do not think it's becoming of the whip. That being said, Mr. Speaker, uh, I did not call a point of order at that time. I did at 1.54, when the Leader of the Official Opposition was in discussion uh, through question period with the Minister of Municipal Affairs, talking about something that has a lot of Albertans concerned with the UCP government inserting themselves between funding uh, from the federal government to municipalities, uh, as well as many, many other entities. Uh, a big thank you to the folks at Hansard, because I do have uh, the Blues in this case. Uh, and as per the Blues, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, as part of his response, said, well, I think it's courageous of the Honourable Member to talk about standing up for communities because that leader, when she was Premier, never did it once for Alberta in the entire four years, at which point I rose on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rose on 23 H, I, and J. Uh, the Minister, who has been a member of this chamber for many, many years, uh, was making direct allegations against another member, impugning false and unavowed motives to another member, and using abusive and insulting language of a nature likely to create disorder, because he quite literally named her and insulted her and her record as Premier, suggesting she did nothing to help people in Alberta. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe me calling this point of order set off a flurry of future points, uh, but I was not calling it simply because it was personalized. I was calling because it was an insult. Uh, and for someone who dropped child poverty by 50 per cent, we could debate. I won't get into it. I think we're continuing the debate. The Honourable the Government House Leader. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, this is not a point of order. On numerous occasions, members on the opposition have used very similar lines, like the member for such and such, the minister of such and such, has done nothing for their constituents, has done nothing for the uh, stakeholders under their ministry. Mr. Speaker, this is uh, ridiculous. It wasn't a personal attack. It was a comment on the opposition leader's record as Premier. On this side of the House, we feel that was a very dark four years for this province. Uh, I see you have a large stack of papers there. We have many points of order to get to, so I'll uh, keep my re remarks short and say, not a point of order, very similar to many remarks said in this chamber, matter of debate. I do have the benefit of the Blues, and uh, while I appreciate it's possible that the Honourable that the Blues were posted, they are not to be posted until a following uh, question period, uh, but we will deal with that matter separately. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs did say the following when she was Premier, she never once did have, uh, she never did it once for Alberta in the entire four years. It's uh, difficult to, to know, talk about standing up for communities. Uh, this uh, is a matter of, the, uh, matter of debate on the Premier's record of which that's what, or the former Premier's record of which we're here to do. This is not a point of order. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. At 156, the... Uh, pool. 
who rose on a point of oh, it would appear the honorable the minister of municipal or of uh, seniors and community and social services rose on a point of order. It appears the government health leader is rising to argue, su argue such a order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, and uh, for this and all future arguments, I will just preface it by saying don't have the benefit of the blues. So I'm going to go with what I have in my hand. Uh, at the time, the, uh, the uh, leader of the opposition was speaking and had said uh, UCP is scared of uh, things they don't understand, which, makes, uh, which means, of course, they've been uh, chasing post-secondary education with torches and picks, uh, fiscal torches and pitchforks. Mr. Speaker, this language is certainly meant to create disorder in this chamber. Torches and pitchforks are, <clears throat> torches and pitchforks are something that we see in lynch mobs. That is not the case. This is government policy. That language is inflammatory. And uh, I believe under 23 H, I, and J that it is a point of order. I'll leave it in your hands. The official opposition house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I disagree. I believe this is uh, important language in the matter of debate on an issue of seriousness. Uh, certainly, um, I, I feel this is a continuation of debate to, to talk about it. Uh, and I've certainly seen it uh, used colloquially in uh, greater public many, many times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do have the benefit of the blues. The Honourable the, men, the Leader of the Official Opposition said the following. Oh, my apologies. Is there anyone else? Seeing none, I am prepared to rule. She said the following. Post-secondary education with a fiscal version of torches and pitchforks for years, and this bill is just more of the same. Uh, in the absolute strongest possible of cautions, uh, members, literally members of the official opposition, have risen on this very point of order with respect to the uses of the term torches and pitchforks. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South was one of them on a number of occasions who expressed deep concern and care about the use of such language in the Assembly for the implications that it may have. I appreciate the Leader of the Official Opposition uh, was cautious in her language when she said a fiscal version, but there's no doubt that she knew the language was provocative. I encourage her to govern herself accordingly. This is not a point of order. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. Honourable members, at 2 o'clock, the Honourable the Government House Leader rose on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on 23 H, I, and J. This, uh, I will say that this, on its own, is likely not a point of order. However, we have shown, as recent as yesterday, that a pattern of inflammatory language and questions coming from the members opposite creates disruption. It's not necessarily about politics or policy. It ends up being about the person. And Mr. Speaker, in this case, whether you're referring specifically to a member of the government caucus or you're referring to the government caucus as a whole, you should not be able to say that we are ignoring Indigenous peoples when they tell us to keep them safe in their homes. Mr. Speaker, that is such a blanket remark. There are so many amazing Indigenous communities around this province that we work diligently for uh, and we care for and uh, work with them. Uh, it is inflammatory to suggest that we are ignoring their needs, especially on something as severe as wildfires. Um, again, I leave this in your capable hands, but Mr. Speaker, this kind of language and language similar to it that draws broad stroking, um, that, that makes broad stroking statements about government policy and how it is ignoring or doesn't care about or is hateful towards. Mr. Speaker, it's unhelpful in this chamber. It doesn't rise to the level of debate. I believe it's a point of order, and if not it is today, it will be another time as they continue to use this kind of language. Opposition House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do not believe this is a point of order, that this is a matter of debate, that we are speaking about a government and their actions or inactions. Uh, that in his remarks, the government House Leader referred to yesterday's points of order as informing him calling this today. I would submit to you that there is a very big difference about a political party or a caucus wanting people to live and die in encampments versus suggesting that the government is in ignoring voices when we see that happening through their actions. Uh, I believe this is a matter of debate, and I look forward to your ruling. Seeing none, I do have the benefit of the blues, and I am prepared to rule. The UCP is a uh, failed track record on Indigenous engagement for emergency response. Now they're ignoring Indigenous peoples 
when they tell the government they need to be kept safe in their home. Uh, I do not find this a point of order. I appreciate the remarks raised by the Honourable the Government House Leader. I will take them under advisement. Uh, at no point in time uh, during uh, the speakership have uh, I provided any sort of caution on this type of language. I'm not saying that it could never be a point of order in the future, but it certainly isn't today. I consider this matter dealt with and concluded. At uh, 2.27, the Honourable the Government House Leader rose on a point of order. Oh, sorry, correction. Uh, the Honourable the Government House Leader, I have, uh, could be 2.25, it could be 2.27. This one, oh, sorry, 2.04. Yeah, this, uh, the Honourable the Government House Leader rose on a point of order. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton South was speaking. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, at the time noted, the Honourable Member from Edmonton South was speaking. Uh, we were talking about post-secondary education. Uh, similar to the previous point of order, uh, I believe that language used, again, making broad, wild accusations about what the Premier is or is not interested in doing, I think is not helpful to the debate in this chamber. Uh, would, more than be would, would be more than happy to entertain questions about government policy and what it may or may not do. But to suggest, and I quote with... Uh, without the benefit of the blues, but with my limited ability to write down notes. Will the Premier admit she is using the federal government as a smoke screen to justify control of organizations and academics in, in Alberta? Mr. Speaker, that is an absurd assertion. Like, it is absurd. The member from Edmonton South should be, frankly, ashamed. Whether she or someone else wrote that question, to bring that kind of tripe into this chamber is ridiculous. The Premier's job has been, is, and always will be to defend the best interests of Albertans, including those in post-secondary and academics. We are going to defend our province from uh, federal interference and make sure we do what's best for Albertans, Mr. Speaker. So this is a point of order under 23 HINJ, and, uh, but I leave it in your hands. The Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, this is not a point of order. However, what the Government House Leader just said during his argument would have been a point of order if he had said it in the chamber normally. Telling another member they should be ashamed has been ruled a point of order numerous times. The Government House Leader loves to use his arguments to further debate and insult our members. I wish he would stop. Uh, in this case, will the Premier admit she's using the federal government as a smokescreen to justify control of organizations and academic thought in Alberta is an important question and part of the debate that we were undertaking. Uh, certainly, uh, if we refer back to your very first ruling today when uh, the actions or inactions of an individual member as Premier was not considered a point of order, uh, suggesting that someone didn't do anything to stand up for communities in an entire four years, I would suggest this is also a matter of debate. Brothers, I do have the benefit of the blues and I am prepared to rule. Will the pre, uh, the comments on question, the record in the blues is, will the Premier admit she is using the federal government as a smokescreen to justify control of organizations and academic thought uh, in Alberta? Many of those organizations are within, uh, and uh, organizations and schools are within the purview of the Honourable, the Premier, uh, of which uh, a, point could, a point could be made that this is a question about government policy. I don't consider it a point of order. The matter is, com I consider the matter uh, concluded and dealt with. Uh, I believe the next one is at 207. The uh, Honourable um, Official Opposition House Leader rose on a point of order. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at 2.07, in discussion about uh, life leases, uh, during a wholly inadequate answer, the Minister of Service Alberta and Red Tape Reduction, uh, and I do not have the benefit of the blues, Mr. Speaker, uh, but I believe he said, the member for St. Albert can't act with class or dignity. Uh, I rise under 23 H, I, and J. Uh, very abusive and insulting language of a nature likely to create disorder in this place and also uh, a direct insult to another member hurled across during important questions about something that we even had guests in the gallery here to listen to the debate on. Uh, this is a point of order and I hope that the member apologizes and withdraws. From a house leader. 
withdraw and apologize. I, can, I accept the apology. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded at 208. The Honorable Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services rose on a point of order. The Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rose on a point of order at uh, that time in regards to the member from Highwood Norwoods. Oh, for Ka no, no, no. Edmonton Highlands, uh, who at that time, Mr. Speaker, in a fairly heated debate, uh, took her time, rose out of her chair, started to interact with members of the gallery, uh, riled them up so much, Mr. Speaker, that a sergeant of arms staff had to come and provide some caution. Uh, it visibly could be seen by members of the chamber. It is highly inappropriate, Mr. Speaker, and I would suggest even dangerous at times for members of this place to interact with the gallery in that type of a context. Uh, and I think is concerning, Mr. Speaker, particularly given uh, that the NDP, as far as I know, are the first party in history to bring a guest to the floor of this chamber to interrupt a throne speech, Mr. Speaker. And there clearly appears to be a pattern of trying to disrupt this House, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the members that are within this House doing the work of democracy in this province. The opposition House leader. Certainly, the NDP has never brought someone in with the purpose of disrupting this chamber. That is incorrect. Uh, and regarding interactions with members of the gallery, I'm afraid I had my back to the member from Highlands Norwood. I do not believe that she would be doing that. Um, and, but I did not see uh, and did not have view of whatever these events may have been. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, honorable members, are there others wishing to provide any information? And just double check. Uh, incident. Appreciate the input. Is there anyone with, with new information or additional information? Seeing none, uh, I am prepared to rule, but prior to doing so, at 2.08, uh, so just moments following the, uh, the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services rising on this particular point of order, the government house leader also rose on a point of order. Are, is this a separate issue or is it the same issue? Can you remember? Okay. Well, I will so deal. withdraw mine. Uh, I will. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, here's what I would say: is uh, I did not see the honourable member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood do that. If she did do that, uh, it is a point of order, as I have provided caution to members of the assembly with respect to engaging with members of the gallery who are here visiting us. I always value and appreciate those who have come to join us. However, uh, it is their role to observe. It is our role to uh, debate the important issues of the day and engaging members in the gallery under any circumstances, with the exception of acknowledging their presence, is entirely inappropriate. If the member did it, she should apologize. Uh, but I consider the matter dealt with and concluded as I did not see it myself. Honourable Members, at 2.22, the Honourable Official Opposition House Leader rose while well, the Honourable the Minister of um, Technology Innovation was speaking. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. At 2.22, uh, we saw behavior in this House that we've actually seen before and you have cautioned against. The Minister of Municipal Affairs was yelling bye at the Leader of the Official Opposition as she departed the Chamber. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know well, as do all members, and particularly the Minister of Municipal Affairs, who has at many times served on the House team, uh, that as per House of Commons patterns and practices, uh, allusions to the presence or absence of a member or ministers in the Chamber are unacceptable. Speakers have upheld held this prohibition on the grounds that there are many places that members have to be in order to carry out all of the obligations that go with their office. Now, Mr. Speaker, this has occurred multiple times, and I have not always risen to call a point of order, uh, but the behaviour needs to be stopped, uh, and as far most recently that I could find in a very quick search, November 29, 2023, on Hansard page 422, while delivering your ruling on a point of order to do with presence or absence, you said, Mr. Speaker, and while I'm on my feet, I too have heard the Honourable Member from Warrenville St. Albert, perhaps making reference to the presence or absence of members in the Chamber, and if he continues to proceed in doing so, there's a very real possibility that it would also be a point of order. Now, the Minister, uh, the Member from Warrenville St. Albert and the Minister of Municipal Affairs sit beside each other. They've both engaged in the same bad behaviour. Uh, I would ask that 
that you rule at a point of order so we can make sure that it stops. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the time noted, um, I did hear the word goodbye. No idea who it was directed at, Mr. Speaker, because at the time, while the Leader of the Opposition was exiting the chamber, um, for whatever reason, she was exiting the chamber, and uh, after she had left the chamber, the word goodbye was used a couple more times. I don't think the word goodbye is necessarily a point of order. I would say there is precedence where the, mem where the Minister for Red Tape and Service Alberta has said, hey, part-timer or something offensive, that was a point of order. Totally get it. That was a, that, and that was apologized for, and you've ruled on this. But in this instance, Mr. Speaker, it is impossible for me to suggest who that comment was directed at. It could have been directed at someone on the government side who was exiting the chamber at the same time, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I, I leave it in your hands, but I don't believe this is a point of order. I am prepared to rule, and I do have the benefit of the blues. I would say this, that uh, I've provided caution in the past on the referring to the presence uh, or absence of um, a member. Uh, I have no reliable record of who said what. Uh, I do have the benefit of the blues. I would encourage members that it's unparliamentary to refer to the presence or absence uh, of a member, as there's lots of reasons why members may or may not be able to attend the chamber if the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs or whoever the other allegations are made about uh, are doing that. I encourage them to stop and I will be listening with keen attention in the future. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. This is not a point of order. At 2.35, the Honourable Member for Calgary Curry was speaking and the Honourable the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services rose on two separate occasions. Yes, Mr. Speaker. At the time noted, the member for Calgary Curry was speaking and said in her remarks, and I don't have the benefit of the blues, and I don't even have even like an official record besides some borderline illegible chicken scratch that I put down, but it's something to the effect of the Premier said smoking isn't bad for you and getting cancer is their own fault. Now, we know in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, that is wildly inaccurate. That is wildly false. The Premier has never said that. Uh, I don't know why that member would even suggest that the Premier said that smoking isn't bad for you. It's certainly a, a distortion. and sounds a lot like a personal attack. I would say this rises to the level of a point of order under 23H I and J. And I count one, two, three, four points of order on this specific member. It seems like there is a pattern of making personal attacks uh, specifically against the Premier in her line, in her lines of questioning. The official opposition house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't believe this is a point of order, that this is a matter of debate. Uh, and in defending this, I very quickly typed uh, the name of the Premier and the word cancer. Uh, the CTV <laughs> News article from Calgary, UCP leadership candidate Daniel, um, apologies, under fire by all political stripes for cancer comments has within it, while listening, Smith, uh, again, apologies, My, it's been a long day, Mr. Speaker, said she believes some of the blame falls at the hands of the patient. Once you, and this is a quote, once you've arrived and got stage four cancer and there's no radiation and surgery and chemotherapy, that is an incredibly expensive intervention, not just for the system, but also expensive in the toll it takes on the body. But when you think everything that built up before you got to stage four and that diagnosis, that's completely within your control and there's something you can do about that that is different. Uh, and so the member from Calgary Curry uh, is not alone in attributing uh, these statements, uh, which we have recorded and we know that uh, the Premier did say, uh, referencing them in her question, I believe, is a matter of debate. Uh, not intended as a personal insult, uh, just a matter of record, Mr. Speaker. I believe this is not a point of order. Are there others? I do have the benefit of the blues and I am prepared to rule. The Premier says that smoking is actually, uh, isn't actually bad for you and that stage four cancer is the patient's fault. She proceeded. There was a point of order called. The Honourable Member for Calgary Curry continued to say, can the Premier or any members opposite tell us why they know better than highly trained professionals uh, about what's best for the care of patients? Another point of order was called. It's tough to know if those were the two of the same. She continued. Uh, 
uh, this, it's possible this is in the second one, but maybe with some agreement from the government house leader, we can deal with these both together because she continued to say, uh, can the minister tell Albertans why he knows the support recovery plan and when he's shown such disdain and disrespect for the life-saving workers on the front lines and an, an additional point of order was called? Is this all in the same point of order? No, they're different. Okay, that's fine. Uh, then, uh, then I'm happy to deal with the first one. Uh, I believe this is a matter of debate, not a point of order. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. The second point of order, is the minister rising on that one, or would the government house leader like to rise on it? The Honourable, the Minister of Seniors, Community yeah, and Social Services. Yeah, help the government house leader out as a member of the government house leader union. Uh, that one I believe I rose on. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are too a member of well, the opposition house here, union. We'll let you in. Uh, Premier denying protection for trans youth or something to that effect, uh, which I believe will be the blues in front of you. Mr. Speaker, again, this is uh, a rise on 23 H, I, and J. Certainly that is a, an outrageous accusation to make to a member of this place. It will cause disorder inside this chamber if members continue to do that, to say that about uh, the Honourable Premier, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not a true accusation, Mr. Speaker, and while it uh, will not presume to know where you will head today, what I can tell you is that uh, is language like that, Mr. Speaker, will certainly create disorder in this place long term, Mr. Speaker, because it's not true when it comes to uh, the Premier's position on trans youth. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, this side of the House will certainly defend their Premier and make that clear, and she is a member of this place and should not be accused of that in the future. Honourable uh, official opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, what's also not true is that the previous Premier did nothing to advocate for communities. Talking about what Premiers do or do not do has already been ruled in this uh, current day as being in order. Uh, in this case, uh, talking about uh, this government and this Premier denying health rights is actually a matter of debate and fact and number health-based organizations and legal-based organizations have already come out denouncing this government's policies. Uh, this is a continuation of debate uh, and a very important one, particularly for vulnerable trans youth who are at higher rates of homelessness, suicide, and many other challenges. Uh, this has been one of the key fights in this uh, assembly so far this session, Mr. Speaker, and I imagine it will continue. Uh, I believe this is not a point of order, and I look forward to your ruling. Are there others? I... Uh, well, on this particular point of order, uh, I do not have the benefit of the blues. It is, I am uh, unsure of what has been said uh, in this case, and uh, without a reliable record, it's impossible for the speaker to rule. Having said that, I, um, uh, th there was another point of order called uh, at 236 where, uh, or uh, on or around, where the Honorable, the member for Calgary Curry stated the following, such disdain and disrespect for life-saving workers of the front line, um, uh, uh, of which, I mean, I'm happy to argue the point. I, um, that's your next one. Please feel free to proceed. I think you led in. It was just, just, just fine, Mr. Speaker. Um, I don't have the benefit of the blues and, again, trying to read my own writing, but uh, that was great you read it out because, again, that kind of language is very disrespectful, showing disdain for workers. We do not show disdain for workers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Alberta recovery model is one that's leading the world, leading the world in helping addicts get off the cycle of addiction and back into recovery. That is the plan, that is the job of the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, and I may say, Mr. Speaker, if I may take a moment, that he is doing a phenomenal job at that. Literally saving lives. Now, I'm not going to go here and debate government policy, but, will I will, but what I will say is, to show that level of disdain and disrespect for the government's work, and to suggest that the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction has that level of disdain and disrespect for addicts and workers is disrespectful in and of itself. I think it's a point of order, it creates disruption, uh, under 23 H, I, and J, and I, but I'll leave it in your hands. 
the official opposition house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is not a point of order. The workers themselves have expressed these things to the members of the official opposition. Uh, and this government is leading the world only if you cherry pick the evidence, as this government is wont to do. Uh, I believe that this continues the debate, that it is important in this place, and that the official opposition needs to be able to represent what the workers are telling us directly. Uh, I look forward to your ruling, Mr. Speaker. Are there others? Do you have the benefit of the blues, which I already read into the record? Can the Premier or any minister's opposite tell if they know better than highly trained... Oh, correction. That was the last one. Uh, the... Um, Healthcare providers is on an all-time high. Can the minister tell Albertans how he uh, plans to support recovery when he's shown such disdain and disrespect for life-saving workers serving on the front lines? Uh, I actually do believe that this rises to the level of point of order. The un unfortunately for the honourable member for Calgary Curry. Uh, went on to use some unparliamentary language off the record, and I think it's reasonable that she apologizes and withdraws. The Honourable Member for Calgary Curry. I apologize and withdraw my statement. Consider this matter dealt with and concluded. At 2.38 I have... Uh, the Honourable Government House Leader rose on a point of order. The Honourable um, Member uh, for... Gary Curry was speaking, the Honourable the Government House Leader. Yes, Mr. Speaker, at the time noted, the member for Calgary Curry was speaking, and without the benefit of the blues, I can say, uh, but I can still feel with that, I feel that this is a point of order, when the member said, the Premier is speaking with extreme ignorance. Obviously, this is inflammatory language. Uh, I think you provided caution on a number of occasions about speaking with ignorance or being ignorant to the facts or just ignorant in general. Um, that uh, certainly is not something that I think is fit for this chamber and for the debate. And I may say as well, Mr. Speaker, that it is our job to debate back and forth the government policy, and if stakeholders are having a reaction to something the government is doing, it is the opposition's job to bring that to our attention. But to make the logical jump from what they're saying to how the member or how the minister feels about something, I think is wildly inappropriate. And so this is why I just, I shouldn't be responding to the, the, the last point of order, but I think it speaks more to what the member from Calgary Curry is saying now and applying um, intent to someone else, which is not the job of members opposite. As to question government policy, 28 and j point of order. Take it away. Official opposition house, uh, the honorable member for Calgary Curry. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Did we already uh, argue? Uh, around ignorance has been uh, ruled out of order in the past, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the member, I would apologize and withdraw because of the yeah, confusion. Uh, sadly for the Honourable Member, because uh, she happens to be taking part in the debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary Curry. I apologize and withdraw my statement. I didn't realize that ignorance was not something that was permitted in chambers. Uh, sorry, just for clarity's sake, it, uh, there are lots of occasions in which you can say the word ignorance. You can't say the Honourable Premier spoke with great ignorance yesterday. That is the, the differential of the two things. Uh, that's point of order. I accept the apology. Consider the matter dealt with and concluded. I believe... Doo -doo -doo. I don't know what time this was at all. Perhaps 2.40. Two the... Uh, official opposition house leader rose on a point of order. Thank you very much. Uh, we are in part of the same exchange, and, and I think we're, we see that uh, certainly the temperatures were quite hot in the House. Uh, in this case, I rose on a point of order because uh, the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, in his response to the member from Calgary, Curry, uh, stated that the members opposite prefer death and destruction. Uh, and I am all for uh, debate on policies, debate on the issues. Um, even talking broadly and, and mischaracterizing what our political opponents might say, uh, but to suggest that any member of this assembly wants their constituents to die, uh, I think 
passes into a point of order, Mr. Speaker. Um, and talking about the members opposite's prefer policy that caused death and destruction, I will tell you, uh, during COVID, uh, the language that the official opposition used, we, concerned about policy and the outcomes that it has, uh, was something we thought about quite a bit. Uh, but certainly we would never occur, accuse the government of wanting people to die and preferring death and destruction. I believe this is a point of order and I look forward to your ruling, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable the Government House Leader. Oh. The House no, no. Leader. Deputy Governor House Leader, sorry. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the truth is, when we're debating policy, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I understand it's a sensitive topic. I'm happy to take your direction at the end of this. But when we're debating policy surrounding addiction, the reality is death is a part of that. This chamber, if nowhere else, we should be able to have an honest, frank discussion about the consequences of the policies adopted by either side. I hear regularly, while answering questions from the other side, shouts of how many children they believe are dying because of our policies, invoking death regularly. The truth is it is a sensitive topic, one of which the policy we were debating safe supply. This government vigorously disagrees with the other side because we do believe it does cause death. Uh, and this is a matter of debate, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the most important matter of debate because of the seriousness of the consequence of the policy at hand. Happy to take your direction. Are there others? You can go ahead if you want. Uh, honourable members, because the exchange took place so late in the question period, uh, I don't have the benefit of the blues. And uh, in light of a fairly robust and uh, vigorous debate over a period of time, you can well imagine uh, the exact language that the minister used, uh, I am unsure of. And without the benefit of the blues, it's difficult for the speaker to rule. I do agree um, that uh, issues around policy of political entities or otherwise uh, can create strong emotions on both sides. I <clears throat> would recommend that over the weekend, all members consider about uh, or, or make some considerations on what type of chamber do we want to have and uh, do we largely want to focus on the actual issues of the day uh, or is our primary objective uh, to um, perhaps score political points inside the chamber. I hope that more broadly speaking, uh, we can um, each reflect on our own personal responsibility in ways that we can let raise the level of decorum more broadly. And that, um, well, people might have strong feelings about sometimes <clears throat> how the speaker is ruled or otherwise, uh, that we, don't take the opportunity to try to push the boundaries of what is or what isn't a point of order, that all members will uh, accept that uh, there's going to be certain levels of frustrations of both sides of the assembly and that that frustration is part and parcel with robust and meaningful debate. And I think we are on a very, very, uh, on the edge of a pretty concerning um, tone and tenure in the House where we saw today, quite frankly, members of the opposition rose every time, members of the government said something that uh, could have been perceived as personal or could have been perceived as hurtful. And in exchange for that, we saw members of the government rise and call points of order on every situation that could have been perceived as personal or could have been perceived as frustrating. And we've spent well over 35 minutes discussing those things. I don't think that it's helpful more broadly the speaker is but a humble servant of the assembly, and if that is what the if that is the pathway that the assembly chooses, 
I'm happy to make rulings for 30, 40, 50 minutes uh, following question period. I'm not convinced it's the best use of our time. I hope members uh, will take some time to be reflective on that. Uh, this isn't a point of order. I consider the matter dealt with and concluded. The Honourable. Understanding, Deputy. Deputy. Mr. Speaker, uh, that it's dealt with included in your mind. In the spirit of your comments, I will unreservedly withdraw and apologize. I consider this matter dealt with and concluded, and I hope that same spirit that we see here this afternoon will flow to Monday, that the blessings of the weekend, your family, and all of the good things in your lives will come true over the weekend. <laughs> And we can come back on Monday and have teamwork make the dream work. Orders of the day, orders du jour. Government bills and orders for second reading Bill 12, Consumer Protection Life Leases Amendment Act 2024, debate adjourned. Dr. Metz speaking. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverview has risen to join in the debate. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, very happy to join the debate on this very important uh, topic. Uh, of course, we're debating Bill 12, the Consumer Protection uh, Bracket Life Leases and a Bracket, Bracket Amendment Act 2024. So I just uh, sort of want to start with some basics about um, what this legislation is uh, doing and just what exactly life leases are. So life leases are a form of long-term housing tenure and they're typically for older adults and uh, providers specifically do target seniors uh, in their marketing. They're often sold as more affordable housing options for seniors. They're supposed to provide fewer home maintenance responsibilities like snow removal is taken care of and of course this is quite attractive. Uh, to uh, many people because they'd prefer not to have to do that. And um, uh, so that's a, one of the main, one of, one of the key reasons I think people want to live in this kind of a situation. Uh, oftentimes, too, uh, the, uh, one of the partners has passed on and um, people, you know, like to move into sort of more congregate settings so that they are not all by themselves in a, a you know, a single family home or uh, there is often common space, activities that people are uh, together with. So um, this, is, this makes this quite attractive to uh, uh, people who are interested in this kind of um, housing situation. The only difficulty, of course, uh, one of the significant difficulties right now is that uh, this, uh, this life lease uh, program has been found to have significant uh, flaws. So significant that uh, millions and millions of dollars are being lost by Albertans, like hundreds of Albertans are impacted by this because uh, Alberta has not uh, properly managed this situation. And I just want to read into the record uh, a letter from a constituent in uh, Sherwood Park, uh, from my colleagues uh, writing, where there is a, a life lease uh, facility. And, I, and uh, it's in response to Bill 12. And uh, she writes that I'm writing to express our distress with a life lease legislation. It is, does not address the interests of, our, of seniors who feel trapped, misled, and lied to. Now or in the future with life leases, where is the protection? There is no protection in this legislation for those of us in current life lease situation, be it on the queue to be paid out for those still living in life lease units. And uh, she beseeches the government to please reconsider uh, Bill 12 and then shares a little bit about her own family story. She talks about her mom left Vancouver Island following her father's passing, so that's sort of a typical situation. Oftentimes, women do outlive men, and uh, when that happens, they often want to move into a more congregate setting. Um, so after her, uh, her father's passing, to be closer to her family, which was here, uh, Bedford Village appeared to be, the ide to be ideal in that she could, her mother could 
meet with other people her age, have a social life, engage in all the activities offered, go on bus trips to a variety of different venues, and still be close to family. She bought the apartment with her life savings and was told that when she wanted to leave, Bedford would sell it for a small fee and she would receive her money after three months' time. We have since, since learned that most of what we were told is untrue. We have been misled and things are no longer ideal at Bedford. The bus trips have been canceled, their balconies have been locked down, activities have been reduced to a couple of exercises a week. At some point, my mom may need more care and we were relying on the sale of her suite to pay for her extra care. We are not sure uh, she'll ever receive that money now and Bill 12 does not help. We support. Uh, the seniors involved and want fair legislation that protects all seniors. Bill 12 is not ready. More consultation is needed, more protection, and more support for seniors. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, people in the gallery right uh, today uh, who uh, were uh, gathered earlier before we sat in this house uh, to express very similar concerns to the one that I just read in this letter that so many Albertans are uh, not uh, receiving the funds that they're entitled to under these uh, life lease agreements. Uh, we know that uh, there's some bad actors in this sector and uh, some of the mo one of the most egregious uh, bad actor is uh, Greg Christensen and his unscrupulous uh, business practices have caused tremendous suffering for hundreds, hundreds of Albertans. We know that uh, 60 million approximately is currently owed to over 150, more than 150,000 seniors who have terminated their life lease with the Christensen Group of Companies. And it's been over six months that uh, they have uh, the uh, Life Lease Society of Alberta, uh, led by President Karen Dowling, have uh, you know, beseeched the Minister uh, of Service Alberta to do something and Bill 12 is what he's done. And unfortunately, it, he seems to have not have really listened or given enough time for contemplation or uh, you know, uh, made enough time to really understand the issues. Because of course, this legislation does nothing to help current life lease holders. They are still out in the cold and uh, you know, uh, uh, the president, Karen Dowling, uh, said that it feels like a slap in the face that they're blindsided, they really weren't properly consult consulted on this legislation. So these are very important uh, uh, stakeholders in this issue that are not being listened to. And I really uh, ask the government to uh, take a step back. And uh, this legislation needs to be able to support people. And if it can't be done in this legislation, then how can it be done? It's certainly uh, what I've heard from uh, people who are in this situation is they don't feel the government is listening. They don't feel the minister is listening to their concerns. And of course, the consequences are devastating for these families. It, it's really horrific what's gone, gone on. Hundreds of, of families don't have access to the funds that are legitimately theirs. Uh, the impacted seniors uh, are in the latter part of their lives. Uh, if they terminate the life leases when they need higher levels of care. And unfortunately, that's what happens. It happens to many of us. As we age, we need more supports and these facilities can't provide them. So of course, we can't always age forever, you know, if, in this kind of more independent living situation. And so when that's needed, they can't uh, access these funds for this higher level care because of course that's much more expensive. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's causing families across the province just uh, significant stress and difficulties to not have access to these resources. And again, this legislation does nothing uh, to uh, change um, uh, that situation. Uh, so, I mean, really people leave, uh, People uh, terminate their life leases usually for three different reasons. One is that they need this higher level care, which I just mentioned. Another person might 
uh, our family might move because uh, for another reason, sometimes a spouse dies, sometimes uh, couples are in these life leashes and they decide to maybe move closer to family that might not be that area. There's a whole, so, whole bunch of reasons why people move. And, uh, or the final uh, way is that uh, someone who had a life lease passes away. And of course, uh, then the estate uh, would uh, receive the you know, funds owed to them from that life lease. So um, these are all sort of legitimate ways that uh, you know, uh, we as citizens of this province of Alberta should be able to uh, go on with our lives. And uh, when uh, we terminate those leases, we should be able to access those funds. And uh, many said they had been told they would receive uh, money within 90 days, but we know that people have been waiting three years. They have no sense of when they'll ever get it. And, uh, you know, this is just absolutely unjust and completely uh, uh, disturbing that uh, this you know, particular operator that I've already mentioned uh, has uh, so, you know, just sort of ignored the concerns of people and not, uh, you know, done his due diligence, taken responsibility for the situation uh, that is set up. And, you know, another part that I think is important to say in this house is that uh, Greg Christensen is a max donor for the UCP. He uh, maxes out uh, all of his, uh, his uh, political donations to the UCP. So it's in the government's best interest not to make uh, one of their big supporters, their big funders, angry. And so that's kind of a, a bit of a problem. And I hope the government will be responsible about that and actually think of the larger public good and what's most important in uh, our society about making sure their things are done fairly. And if this legislation can't be done, because I, I know that there are some concerns with uh, having uh, legislation that would go back, uh, retroactive for contracts and things like that, there certainly is uh, challenges in the, in the legal system that, um, you know, that would make a really unstable, uh, you know, business situation because uh, you can't always go back after agreements have been made. But there's other solutions that the government can come to and uh, certainly many other things that the government can do to support them, but we're not hearing any of it. And, I, and I've said already that it's been months and months and months now that... Uh, the government it continues to, you know, they say they're concerned, but they don't seem to uh, know what to do about it. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, the minister said in question period today that he has met with um, Greg Christensen 12 times. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of times. Like, what's he doing in those meetings? What's going on? Why have we not uh, been informed of what progress they're having? Is it only this? I mean, one of the things they say, too, there's their investigation that we understand is very limited in scope. Uh, you know, and he, this is why he can't speak freely about that. I think that there's more that the minister could say, but he is choosing not to. But I mean, this is causing so much hardship for many, many Albertans, and it is um, uh, certainly uh, a, a really a horrific situation that is uh, causing so much difficulty for so many. Um, so. I just really uh, think that there is a solution and the government could create it if they opened uh, themselves up to more uh, conversation, certainly uh, with Albertans who are impacted by this and uh, just saying that you know, this legislation is the answer is not the way to go. Um, we know that the, the legislation does bring in some penalties in the Consumer Protection Act, the, this Bill 12 that they've put forward. But it's such small scale, like it's, it's not enough of a penalty to actually make much difference. These are, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a significant, uh, you know, discrepancy. It won't even be a deterrent, it seems like the, the protections are so low. And then the legislation itself, 
And this, of course, isn't for the ones who already have leases. This is for, you know, upcoming leaseholders um, after the legislation is passed is there's a 180-day period for landlords to release the entrance fees. So these are the fees that are about, you know, on average three hundred to five hundred thousand uh, dollars that they that uh, people have paid to uh, you know be part of this lease uh, life lease program. So that's like six months of time, and I, we know Manitoba has not, uh, 90 days, so that's more like three months, which is more reasonable. Uh, oftentimes, when people's uh, health deteriorates. It, uh, it, it can be very rapid. Someone may have a fall and they, you know, uh, hurt their, you know, sometimes there's falls with, uh, you know, they'll break their hip, and they'll need hip replacement, and then they just don't uh, have the ability to continue to live in sort of an independent living facility sometimes. And so, you know, this six-month period can be, again, a really significant hardship for families because they, uh, you know, need that money, of course, to be able to support their loved ones in, you know, higher level care. So 90 days is, is something that other provinces have done, Manitoba specifically. So I just urge the, the government to think about that and, uh, you know, amending that might be one way to address this. But again, as I've said, this is just for people in the future because this legislation, you know, it's not even passed yet. So anybody, okay, thank you. Are there any other members wishing to speak? Bill 12, uh, the member from Calgary Curry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to rise and stand in debate of Bill 12, the Consumer Protection Amendment Act, uh, in regards to life leases. Of course, this has been something that has been a subject of debate for uh, much of the week, and, and rightfully so, Mr. Speaker. It is it is an issue that is just absolutely critical and worthy of our attention, but I, I have to wonder what has taken so long to identify the gaps within the existing legislation that was failing to protect seniors in our community. We all have uh, seniors in our midst. We all want to see the absolute best provided to them and where there is exploitation or uh, mistreatment of seniors, then we really must rise to the occasion and do the utmost within our capacity to support them. Uh, however, Mr. Speaker, speaking of support, uh, I don't support Bill 12. I am thankful, though, for this opportunity to stand up and speak to the legislation um, because, as I mentioned, it is just, it is absolutely critical and it has laid bare some pretty significant gaps in the uh, role of the, the minister's portfolio and in their mandate to appropriately address uh, a, very, a very concerning issue. Bill 12 is a bit of a disappointment though, I think with all of that said, that when we know about all of the kinds of contributions that seniors have made to this province, uh, that Bill 12 does not rise to the occasion that they deserve. It provides little for the people who have been seeking appropriate compensation, especially now, especially now, when the cost of living is so incredibly high. I can't imagine the anxiety and the angst experienced by seniors living on fixed incomes, having, you know, worked for five or six decades, raised a family, paid off the mortgage, did everything that they were supposed to do so that they were comfortable and protected and taken care of in their final years. Um, and now we have folks who are worried about how they're going to uh, provide for their, their children, their grandchildren, uh, and for themselves. As, as their needs may, may grow. As my colleague uh, uh, previously mentioned, you know, things continue to change. Health conditions start to change. Housing needs continue to change. Care needs continue to change for seniors. This is not just a point in time. And if we don't actually assure the protections for folks as those changes come and as those life stages continue, as those life stages rather, continue to evolve, then we are not in fact 
doing the service that they require. Um, Bill 12 does nothing to allay the issues re relevant to existing lice leaf contracts, Mr. Speaker. The bill offers support only to new entrants into life lease contracts. But uh, as, as my colleague for Edmonton White Med has so eloquently and succinctly presented this week, um, there are an awful lot of people for whom this legislation does nothing. The, the what is it, 50, I, think, I, th I believe, I apologize, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but $15 million worth of entrance fees that are, that are owed people as a result of this Christensen contract uh, kind of debacle. Um, and unfortunately, this legislation simply does not provide the kinds of assurances that they will get those entrance fees back in a timely manner to bring a little peace of mind and comfort in their final years. It truly does uh, fall short, I think, of the expectations and the, and, the, and the responsibilities of this government to respond to the needs of seniors, and it certainly does fall short of what life lease contracts and life lease legislation and consumer protection acts are in other provinces, namely Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, my colleague from Edmonton White Med provided some staggering figures yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Many millions of dollars are tied up in life leases. And uh, unfortunately, g governments of, of the past here in Alberta have taken, um, have really taken their time to resolve the gaps in, reg in regulation and lax protection for seniors. Um, as I mentioned, they are the seniors who have built this province, seniors who have worked right to retirement, seniors who have doggedly saved for their final years, and seniors who uh, I wouldn't blame for feeling abandoned in some way by a system that was meant to provide them with the protections that they deserve. And frankly, that they're owed, having paid taxes in all those, for all those decades, contributing mm -hmm. to Alberta's economy and contributing to Alberta's success. And, and now I think they're probably feeling like a bit of a David and Goliath when it comes to advocating for their mm -hmm. rights, for what they are due, for their own money, Mr. Speaker. And so uh, there are certainly some, some, there is some room for improvement with Bill 12. Bill 12 should be changed to include all tenants uh, and every rental unit. It's inexcusable that legislation be introduced that excludes existing tenants, and in doing so, it leaves hundreds of tenants and the entrance fees that they have paid at risk. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are more than 150 families from Christensen facilities alone that are owed approximately $55 million in reimbursements uh, because they haven't been renewed. Uh, perhaps leaseholders have passed away or perhaps they have had to move on as a result of growing uh, care needs or, or just evolving care needs. Once passed, Bill 12 will offer some protection for new life lease contracts, uh, specifically for the return of entrance fee, uh, for, excuse me, for the return of entrance fees, but other protections may or frankly may not be included in the regulations. As is very often the case, uh, the devil is in the details, the proof is in the pudding, whatever analogy we might want to use in that particular context, where um, a real level of granularity and scrutiny of these contracts is absolutely fundamental because lives depend on it, livelihoods depend on it, and, uh, and, and future generations within a family depend on it too. Uh, so back to, the, back to what the bill does and doesn't do. The bill states that an operator must return the leaseholder's entrance fees within 180 days of termination. Uh, but my goodness, 180 days is a very long time, six months, Mr. Speaker, and it is very long relative to legislation in other provinces like Manitoba, where the requirement is a mere two weeks. 14 days versus 180 days. Uh, I would love to hear from the minister about why such incredible leniency was provided within this legislation when uh, not all actors, not all, not all organizations providing life leases have taken advantage of this particular piece of legislation or the contract law that allows for some discrepancies between one contract versus another, but why would we demonstrate such leniency when we've seen that such abuse can take place as a result? 180 days just does not seem justified, Mr. Speaker. 
It makes me think back to a constituent that I have in Calgary, Curry, who contacted my office over the immensely complex, uh, difficult and costly process of dealing with uh, the kind of closing of the estate following the passing of a loved one. Uh, there are dozens of convoluted steps. If anybody has ever had to actually navigate this system, uh, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it takes a long time, it is very resource intensive, and it's often sequential. So one step can only be done once the one previous has been completed, and oftentimes that will involve money, that will involve an estate, that will mean we have to close one step before we can move on to the next. And if we're waiting 180 days for a really fundamental piece of that estate to be resolved, everything else gets delayed. Everything else gets pushed down the line. And so we can easily be talking about a year or more before families can finally achieve some closure and, uh, and, and some tangible steps when it comes to being able to move on following the passing of a loved one. Um, and so I, I just wonder with this six month wait that individuals and Albertans are expected to now uh, abide by, um, that is Bill 12 really for the family? It begs the question if it's for the seniors or is it for shareholders? If, is it for donors or is it for the downtrodden? Uh, now I'll be frank, life leases are not as common in my constituency of Calgary Curry, so perhaps for the folks watching at home, uh, please indulge a moment to, for me to summarize what they actually are. It's kind of a different, they're not as common here in Calgary as my colleagues here are, are nodding. Uh, a life lease is a form of housing tenure where the leaseholder buys the right to occupy a unit in a particular development for a fixed term uh, for life or until the leaseholder can no longer live independently. To enter into such a contract, a leaseholder will pay an upfront entrance fee averaging currently about $300,000. You can imagine maybe that's the sale of the family home that is then reallocated towards getting this, this lease for a particular period of time. Uh, it is in fact a loan to uh, you know, the company that we've been talking about so much today, the Christensen Company, uh, in exchange for which a leaseholder can be assured of a return and an inheritance for their family. If a life leaseholder passes away, moves or, or terminates the lease as a result of changes in their care needs or changes in their housing needs, perhaps the family moves away and they want to be closer, they or the family are supposed to receive the entrance fee less a predetermined amount. And as we've heard this week, there are individuals who have been waiting three years for an average of $300,000. Who amongst us, under the best of circumstances, let alone the current economic climate in Alberta, can wait three years for a $300,000 fee to be returned? And that is to be clear a fee that belongs to them. It doesn't belong to the government of Alberta. It doesn't belong to Christensen's. It belongs to that family, and they are owed, Mr. Speaker. And so before now, as I mentioned, I wasn't very familiar with life leases, but what I have learned since then is really quite shocking, uh, both in operations from what is clearly a dubious business owner and in regards to what is what is a long overdue response uh, in legislation. What I can speak to though with first-hand experience and on behalf of constituents in Calgary Curry is the tremendous hardship under which seniors are required to live right now and increasingly so. Uh, I refer to an email from a resident of Calgary Curry that is indicative of this hardship that no senior should endure. They share that as a senior citizen living with, living with a disability life has become very, very hard. After their basic needs are paid for, there is very little left for transportation, adequate and nutritious food, medications, maybe a, a Christmas present for the grandkids under the tree every year. On a fixed income that results in a condition of chronic poverty, government has got to step up. And if we don't do it for Albertans, then for whom? It is, it is I think, an absolutely fundamental responsibility and duty of all of us in these chambers to ensure that we are closing any gaps that might exist where seniors can fall through the cracks. Uh, and so before I close, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reinforce the open letter sent to the Premier by the Alberta Life Lease Protection Society 
These are the folks uh, who have joined us in the gallery today, and we're so honored to have them in attendance. Um, three key points in the correspondence that they have provided to government. One, engagement has been insufficient. Don't take my word for it. Everyone who participated in a previous Zoom meeting uh, with members of, with the minister and perhaps members of his uh, ministry was under the impression that further consultation would follow uh, and that they were quite shocked and dismayed to learn that the legislation was being tabled without further consultation, without even seeing the legislation as it had been drafted or being briefed on the contents of said legislation. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, requests for further consultation had been ignored. Point number two, uh, they are gravely concerned with the repayment schedule and the training provided to the sales staff of life, lease, of life lease operators. I think it was the minister yesterday who had made a couple of references to the number of nonprofit organizations that were delivering life leases, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we all know nonprofits run on pretty shoestring budgets, uh, and I will you know, give them the benefit of the doubt that they are operating with the greatest of intention and, and generosity to the people who are actually pursuing this as an opportunity for some housing and financial security. Um, but as a result of those shoestring budgets, Mr. Speaker, uh, sometimes it can be challenging to resource the capacity building and the training that we need to ensure that we are in fact dotting all the, all the I's and crossing all the T's. Uh, and so that was a point of concern from the folks with the, Lifely, with the Lifely Society, that salespeople are saying what seniors may want to hear rather than actually addressing the fundamental concerns within the contract and by families. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? It's Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, um, you know, there's been a good number of robust debate on bill number 12. However, I would now like to move to adjourn debate and uh, focus on the other business at hand. Uh, the Minister of Justice, Honourable uh, Deputy House Leader, has moved adjournment on debate on bill 12. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. That motion is carried. Under Government Bills and Orders for a Third Reading, Bill 10, Financial Statutes Amendment Act 2024, Honourable Mr. Horner. The Honourable President of Treasury Board and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to move third reading of Bill 10, the Financial Statutes Amendment Act 2024. Mr. Speaker, Bill 10 would implement six key measures to support Albertans and our economy. It would improve fiscal planning, reporting and spending. It would modernize our land transfer and registration services and support Albertans' health and would ensure Alberta's momentum as Canada's economic engine remains strong. We said we would attract skilled trades workers and this bill keeps that promise so we get ahead of a growing gap. We need these workers to build hospitals, houses and schools. We also need to continue introducing projects throughout the year to diversify our economy like the Alberta Carbon Capture and Incentive Program. To be clear, this amendment will still achieve a balanced budget. While protecting us from unexpected payments which could inadvertently rise up and eat up the entirety of a contingency or require in-year adjustments to other areas, we're not willing to allow unforeseen circumstances to affect the public services Albertans rely on, nor will we allow it to affect investment into Alberta. This includes already successful industries like agri-processing and film and television. The amendments would allow these industries to be even more successful with expanded tax credit programs. Bill 10 fulfills a commitment to protect Albertans' health by adding further costs to vaping as outlined in the tobacco and vaping reduction strategy. Alberta's population is growing and additional revenue is also needed to pay to maintain our high standards of public services. Our land titles and mortgage registration charges will remain the lowest in the country. They will actually only be one-fifth of the Canadian average. Mr. Speaker, Budget 2024 is a responsible plan for today and tomorrow. It balances investing wisely to meet Albertans' needs today while ensuring services that will support the next generations. The amendments in Bill 10 would help make that happen. I'd encourage all members to support it today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you. Are there any other members wishing to speak to third reading on Bill 10? Uh, the member from Calgary Foothills. Got it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today to speak to uh, Bill 10 Financial Statutes Amendment Act. Um, it is difficult to support a bill that covers this much ground, as the minister just said. It, it, it covers uh, quite a few things. And I say that because voting on this bill comes down to uh, all or nothing. You don't get to pick and choose um, as you cast your vote. And it's simply not possible to support everything that is in this bill. While I acknowledge there are elements of this bill that do have potential, this bill is also littered with broken promises from this government. Therefore, I cannot support this bill, and I encourage all members of this House to consider every element of the bill and whether or not it's something that you can support and vote against the bill. I'd like to start out with, uh, of, uh, of the things that are in the bill, I'd like to start out with the amendments to the Alberta Corporate Tax Act and the Film and Television Tax Credit Act and the changes that, that would be made to the application of uh, film and television tax credits. Mr. Speaker, uh, I have been discussing these changes with stakeholders um, in the film and television industry. Um, members of the House might recall that uh, I was the uh, Vice President of Strategy at Calgary Economic Development um, and that put me in touch with, um, with um, stakeholders in this community uh, about attracting film and television activity in this province. And through my prior role, I'm aware of the benefit uh, of the industry to Albertans and the growth uh, that this industry has experienced with previous changes made to film and television tax credits. The film and television industry is an example of the diversification that can take place in this province when the right set of legislation and associated regulations that go with that legislation are put in place. This industry creates good paying jobs in a number of sectors, including the trades such as electrical and construction workers, transportation and equipment operators. The industry also supports hotels and food services in areas where productions are taking place, sometimes in rural Alberta. Mr. Speaker, there are positive elements to the changes brought forward in Bill 10. Changing the timing and application to the tax credits will be helpful. However, as the saying goes, and as my friend from Calgary Curry was uh, saying earlier, the proof is in the pudding, uh, and we need to see the regulations that will follow this legislation. That if the government is considering increasing the tax credits available, or it seems like they are uh, increasing the tax credits available, that this might actually make Alberta kind of move past the benchmarks that we see in other provinces uh, in creating a tax credit that is more favorable than we see elsewhere. Um, it may be that the government is considering regulations associated with the legislation to incent productions in rural settings. And Mr. Speaker, if these are the intentions of the government, increasing the credit available to larger productions may not achieve the outcomes that are being sought. That much of the production that we see in rural Alberta is from local productions and smaller scale productions. And so we do need to make sure we give consideration to those local productions, the smaller budgets associated with those, with those productions, um, ensure that there's no production value in place for those tax credits to be triggered if we really, really want to maximize the production in rural Alberta. Mr. Speaker, this bill would be better served uh, to include further detail on the application of the tax credits and provide additional clarity um, in the outcomes that we want to achieve in those changes. Now, I will also say what is noticeably absent from this bill is any mention of a digital media tax credit or anything meant to achieve similar outcomes for digital media. The UCP government has been promising a digital media tax credit for some time, or the exploration of a tax credit equivalent. In fact, it's included to explore um, something like a tax credit or an equivalent to grow digital media in the uh, mandate letter to the Minister of Technology and Innovation. 
And yet we've seen now two budgets and several acts of legislation later and we haven't heard any word of a digital media tax credit or the support that will be given to growing digital media in Alberta. Through animation and post-production associated with film and television, uh, digital media, this is making up a growing share of film and television activity. Not having a tax credit in place to support these activities not only prevents these activities from happening in Alberta, but in fact drives entire productions to other locations that do have tax credits in place for digital media. Mr. Speaker, we're holding our film and television industry back and not seeing the full value and growth in this industry. Although, it, admittedly, I will say, we have seen this industry grow. We could see additional growth. We're holding them back by not having the tax credits in place that support all elements of production, including digital media. And this is why we see, Mr. Speaker, larger production volumes in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. The digital media um, area extends far beyond film and television to include software industries such as video game development. The global video gaming industry is growing at over 6% per year, anticipated to reach 300 billion by 2029. And we see considerable growth in gaming in Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal, while Alberta is held back by the lack of a digital media tax credit. These other markets can attract global talent uh, by offering larger salaries when a tax credit is in place. Alberta companies struggle to compete in this competitive talent environment. Bill 10 uh, opened the opportunity for a digital media tax credit, uh, but unfortunately is another broken promise by the CCP government. Mr. Speaker, there are many more amendments in Bill 10, including the amendments to the Personal Income Tax Act and the Invest in a Diversified uh, Alberta Economy Act. Uh, and among these changes to agro-processing investments tax credit, we in fact applaud the UCP in borrowing from Alberta NDP policy and what we heard from stakeholders to make agriculture and agro-processing more competitive. Bill 10 is a step in the right direction and I encourage the government to continue pulling ideas from our agricultural policy paper to further enhance the competitiveness of agriculture and agribusiness in Alberta. But for competitiveness in these areas, we need to go beyond this act and the regulations that will come with it. We need to look at other issues that make rural Alberta livable and attractive for living and working. Mr. Speaker, we have experienced an exodus of youth from rural Alberta to the cities. This has been happening for decades under conservative rule in this province. Clearly, the Conservative government in Alberta has no track record in supporting uh, the growth and development that is attractive to youth in Alberta's rural communities. The UCP government has been cutting supports to local agricultural societies. Uh, the UCP government has recently announced a, a declining support to regional economic development agencies. This UCP government fails to deliver on the social infrastructure needed to support rural communities. This UCP government has been dragging its feet on deploying the Rural Broadband Fund, having deployed less than half of the funding as we enter the third year of the program. We remain far from our goal of 100% broadband coverage. And without this coverage, businesses cannot operate effectively. People cannot access remote healthcare services, they can't access remote learning opportunities, Youth are not enticed to stay in their communities. So while this act does borrow from NDP policy and take a step in the right direction, it both falls short in the legislation and likely regulations, um, as well as other facilities and infrastructure required for rural Alberta to be attractive, especially for youth. This government promised to Albertans, uh, and Alberta is calling tax credit that would support the attraction of healthcare workers. And while the occupations uh, that can apply to the tax credits are not listed in this bill, again, we know the details to come later. The government has let us know the credit will apply to construction and trades workers. And Mr. Speaker, there's no denying the need for trades workers in Alberta. But this bill ignores other occupations we so desperately need. Our healthcare system is in a crisis. 
Yet this bill doesn't support our ailing health care system or the workers in it. This bill also doesn't support construction to trades workers that are already doing great work here in Alberta. It doesn't support those who are already living in Alberta that may be pivoting their career or entering into a career in the trades. What is also questionable is the administration of uh, the change to the Personal Income Tax Act. We know the CRA will not be administering this on Alberta's behalf and that Alberta will be incurring the cost to do so. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance has suggested that the, the cost uh, associated with running the program and marketing the program is 40% of the value of the program itself. Um, Mr. Speaker, this government would never provide grant funding to a not-for-profit that said that the administration of the program was 40% of the cost of the program itself. And hasn't this government been telling Albertans that they're business friendly and striving to remove red tape? This program doesn't sound efficient in its delivery or the effectiveness in its outcomes. And perhaps we could have explored other ways to achieve the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. I'll also talk about, as the Minister of Finance talked about, the changes to the Land Titles Act. That while um, Alberta, it is true, Alberta in the, the costs that are associated, uh, the changes that have been made, that Alberta, those costs still remain lower than other provinces. But I'm not sure that in this time of an affordability crisis that we should be happy about increasing those costs for Albertans. The, Mr. Speaker, the average price of a home in Alberta is now over $450,000. With interest rates now hovering at about 4% per year, Albertans are already struggling with home ownership, especially youth. And youth are now thinking that it's simply not attainable for them. Bill 10 would be adding an average of $5,000 to the price of a home by increasing the cost of transferring land titles and mortgages, property transfers and mortgage registrations. Mr. Speaker, how can the government justify these increases to Albertans? As I said, I cannot support everything that is in Bill 10, therefore I cannot support Bill 10. And again, I ask all members of this legislature to consider all elements of Bill 10 and vote against this bill. Thank you. I'll recognize the Minister for uh, Technology and Innovation to speak next. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was listening intently to the member uh, opposite through his uh, remarks, and I felt that some of it required a bit of a response to correct the record. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, he really felt it was important to criticize our government's track record on broadband as one of his key arguments against this bill. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, the NDP never let the facts get in the way of a good story. But Mr. Speaker, Albertans deserve the truth. And the truth is that when the NDP were in government for four years, they invested, wait for it, Mr. Speaker, zero dollars in broadband. They never mentioned it in a budget address. They never mentioned it in a fiscal plan. They never mentioned it in a strategic plan. They never mentioned it in a business plan in any department across all of government. Zero dollars, Mr. Speaker. How's that for a track record? How does that help keep our youth in rural Alberta? How does that help rural Albertans access health care? How does that help rural Alberta access better education? It doesn't, Mr. Speaker. And yet, while that, that member wasn't a part of the government at that time, I, I guess it's important for me to remind him that his party's track record on broadband is a complete failure. The fact is they did nothing. The NDP are so disconnected from reality, they are living in a fantasy land. They seem to think that you can just wave a magic wand and say some magic words and poof, everyone in Alberta will have access to high-speed internet. Well, if it were that simple, Mr. Speaker, why didn't the NDP do it during their disastrous four years in government? Well, either they didn't care, 
or they were incompetent, or it's a more complex task than what they're insinuating. Or maybe, Mr. Speaker, it's all of the above. The good news is, Mr. Speaker, that while the NDP struggle with complex tasks, our government is taking real action to deploy $780 million of public funding to connect every Alberta household over the next several years to reliable, high-speed internet. That's high-speed internet in every corner of the province, Mr. Speaker, every community across this province. We are going to deliver real results for Albertans. Mr. Speaker, the member criticized our track record. Well, $780 million of public funding is a whole lot better than zero. And $212 million of that already committed to projects with shovels in the ground. That's a whole lot better than zero. Mr. Speaker, when you take all of the public funding that we have been able to secure that has been deployed to date, along with the private sector partners who have been putting money to work to build infrastructure for connectivity across our province, we have 110,000 households that did not have access to reliable high-speed internet who now either have it or have it being constructed in their communities. Mr. Speaker, that's 55% of the households that were identified at the outset of the publishing of the Alberta Broadband Strategy that needed access to reliable high-speed internet, that are well on their way. Mr. Speaker, that is a heck of a lot better than zero dollars and zero households, which is the NDP's track record. So, Mr. Speaker, it's a little bit rich for the member opposite to use criticism of the government of Alberta's broadband strategy and our track record on delivering connectivity to rural Alberta as a key argument in his attempt to uh, debate this bill. Mr. Speaker, he talked a lot about track records of keeping youth in rural Alberta. Mr. Speaker, the NDP wouldn't know rural Alberta if it hit them in the face. They never leave the big cities. We know this because when they were in government, everything they did was an assault on rural Alberta. Do we remember Bill 6 and their failed policies on agriculture? We had farmers from all across the province protesting here at the legislature because of the grave consequences of that member's former government uh, and the decisions that they made when they were in power. Mr. Speaker, if there is any party in government or any government in the last number of years that actually understands Alberta, stands up for the interests of Alberta, and defends what is important to rural Albertans, it is this government. It is a united conservative government, Mr. Speaker, and we will never stand, st uh, we will never apologize for standing up for rural Alberta. Alberta, we will always defend the interests of rural Alberta. And I am confident that the evidence on track record, it, the proof of our track record for rural Alberta is the election itself. How many rural NDP MLAs do we have? And how many rural uh, uh, UCP MLAs do we have? I think the evidence is clear, Mr. Speaker. Rural Albertans know who's got their back. Rural Albertans know who understand what strategic initiatives need to be taken in order to advance their interests, and they know that it is a United Conservative government that will do that. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope that this is helpful to you. I hope this is helpful to all members of this Assembly Help to me. clear the record, to set the members opposite straight, to ensure that we are dealing with facts and not feelings because facts are what are going to move Alberta forward. Facts are what is going to deliver high-speed internet to rural Alberta. Facts are what is going to deliver a brighter future for our youth. And the facts are on our side, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak uh, to Bill 10? Seeing no Calgary Elbow has risen to speak. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, so so the topic of uh, debate is the uh, financial statutes amendment act. It's the enabling act of uh, of the budget. And uh, if I, if I'm to quote uh, uh, Ed Broadbent, uh, budgets are values in miniature. Um, this budget is about the values of this government, and sadly, um, it's, uh, it's, it, 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 it pains me to say uh, that it's a budget of broken promises. Um, starting from the most signature policy 
that this government proposed as an election promise. They promised that there would be a tax cut for Albertans. Now, I know that me standing up here talking about a tax cut that we didn't promise, uh, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it may seem a little bit strange, but Albertans had a choice in the last election. They had a choice of a government that would pay to fix health care, fund education so you got smaller class sizes, get Albertans a family doctor, or they had a choice of immediate affordability in the form of cash in their pockets, and Albertans chose the other option. That's democracy. What they have now is neither. They have neither what they voted for, nor what they could have voted against. It's an assault on democracy. It is deeply offensive. And especially as we find that there was only a single six-page briefing note in July in which the tax cut was killed is an insult to the people of Alberta. And so let's start there. And, and uh, the minister has, has, has mentioned many times that, look, we can't project what a tax cut would cost in the budget because there's nothing in legislation and there's no uh, 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 ministerial um, uh, evaluation, and so therefore it's not in the out years. That could have, been, that could have happened in, in fall. The enabling legislation could have been passed because as, as much as... Uh, on the other side of the house, they love talking about the 15 to 19 government. The government between 19 and now is over there. And they have the power and the ability to make those choices and the power and ability to pass laws to fulfill on their election promises. And I wish they would, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate the indulgence of this House. Um, thank you very much. Any others wishing to speak? Seeing none, I believe I am uh, Minister of Finance and Treasury Board, President of Treasury Board to close debate. The clothes have been waived. The Honourable President of Treasury Board and Minister of Finance has moved third reading of Bill 10, Financial Statutes Amendment Act 2024. Those in favour of the motion for third reading, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. The motion is carried. Bill 10, Financial Statutes Amendment Act 2024 is now read a third time. Minister of Justice and Deputy House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A wonderful and productive week from all sides of this House. However, it is now Thursday and it is nearing time to go home. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the work that you've done. I move now to adjourn uh, the Assembly until 1.30 on Monday, April 15th. Having heard the motion from the Minister of Justice, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. That motion is carried. Uh, the Assembly stands adjourned until Monday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. <laughs>